beautiful. So we're just in that holding pattern oh, yeah, yeah. for Facebook, but I can go across when we put. Ready? He's going to go anyway. <laughs> oh, actually, oh, what I'll do is. No, I'll... No, 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 Facebook. I'm going to Zoom. No, we're not in Zoom. No. no. So on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Do you want to start making a gin and tonic? Yeah. So it looks like we're doing something. <laughs> of course we're doing something. The computer's not working. <laughs> go, go, Instagram Live. Right, I think it works. I think we're in the here, boys. The system works. Might be in here. Let me see if I can find us. Yeah. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet. Ooh, we're sideways though. Are we sideways? Yeah. Okay, we need to go. <laughs> it's only me and Paul at the moment. So. Sorry, sorry boys, we're getting there. That's, that's better? Yeah, that's better. Mm. We're looking like we're filming a TikTok. <laughs> we're definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. G'day everyone and welcome to another episode of After Hours here at the Oak Barrel. Um, we are live on the Oak Barrel Facebook, live on the Oak Barrel YouTube, and for the first time ever, live on the Oak Barrel Instagram, which yes. could work, could be a disaster. We don't know how this is going to go. Uh, my name is Scott Fitzsimon. Sitting to my left, your right, is Joe Perry. Uh, Joe, our wine educator here at the Oak Barrel. Myself, our whiskey and spirits educator. Joe, how are you doing? Good, mate. Good. It's, uh, it's much later in the week than we normally do this. Yeah. With everything that's been happening. It doesn't feel like it, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those who... I mean, I don't know if anyone who has... Facebook has Instagram, or if anyone has Instagram has Facebook. I think they're, they're pretty separate you markets these watching days. On, watching on both? Yeah, because phones can only take one one app at a time, right? That's that's how the internet works? Yeah, I thought so. Pretty much, yeah. So if you're tuning into our very first one, this is actually episode 25 of After Hours. Uh, once, once a week, since about mid-last week. Uh, last week, since uh, last year. And basically... Here at the Oak Barrel, um, in smack bang in the middle of the Sydney CBD, we have closed the doors for the day. Um, and what normally happens now is Joseph and myself sit around, drink some drinks, and talk about booze, the booze industry, um, and sort of give you guys a bit of an insight into how we make decisions about what is um, coming coming through into the store, how it gets on the shelf, and, and that sort of thing. So um, there's a few comments coming through on the Instagram and the Facebook. We're going to divide and conquer tonight. Joey, yeah. if, if I take the old um, Facebook, do you reckon you, you can? can you, you know how to work Facebook, yeah. Right? Yeah. But um, yeah, we, we're gonna we're gonna say g'day to everyone as a job and g'day to BA Weber drinking the Vitus right now. Is is that the Vinus Fire beer? I think. I have no idea. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it is, idea. and it is cracking beer as well. Um, and Quaker's Hat say g'day as well. Um, welcome. Yeah. These guys have worked it out. Look at it. Yeah. Fine. Look at us. We know how to use technology. How good is that? Um, the, the, the difficult thing about Instagram is going vertical. I've had to wear pants for this one, which is a little bit frustrating, but, but that's how it is. But we've got a few different things coming up to tonight that we're going to try. Um, starting with, uh, with some new products, a new gin, then some new whiskies, then we're going to drink some new, um, some old cherry. Yeah. No. Um, well, yeah, try and, try and catch up on everything that we've been promoting and, and buying and drinking over the last what 10 days or so yeah it's a lot, lots happened definitely and I mean it's been a it's a weird time to announce um, or bring new products to market because you can't really launch them and that sort of thing so it's been a little bit quiet on the old new product front but uh, we're finding new interesting ways to do it but I'm actually here drinking a GNT at the moment with the brand new yeah. harvest um, gin from Archie Rose which is part of, it's a new limited edition series basically it's what's well, a new vintage series and what's it, what's it going to be essentially is once a year they release a gin that sort of celebrates diversity of, of the various produce we make here in Australia and grow here in Australia. This, um, the 2019 vintage um, released a couple of weeks ago is uh, very citrus heavy, Pormans, orange, bergamot, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of fresh, 
um, peel and um, you know fruit from up near the Hunter region, um, all individually distilled. Um, we're giving a bit of a road test uh, in a gin and tonic using uh, quite a lean gin and tonic for this one. I wanted to talk, or, or at least taste more gin and less tonic. So the the Skinny London the Artisan Drinks Co. For Artisan. Um, but yeah, Ooh, spit on myself. That's a good start. <laughs> Mount Sloy Distilling says, how are the Sullivan's Cove barrel stave pens going? I have, busters. Yeah, they have, I have a tracking number. They've been sent. They're, <laughs> they're made. They're on their way um, for those waiting for the awesome. pens. Um, this works. Yeah. Tick, it works yeah. as gin and tonic. Tick that box. So here we're looking at a really sort of almost spring, summery, fresh, citrus forward style yeah. of gin. Yeah. Um, and it's actually... You designed can, for this sort of thing, a light, a light G&T. Yeah, I don't know how good the colour is going to come through in this, but you can actually see a fair bit of colour um, coming through there. Maybe if I go In there too. Way. Yeah. yeah it's so it has like a very slight amberish tinge towards it. Yeah, it's um, coming from the uh, orange blossom. Yeah, right, that's okay. been in there, so that, that's a natural yeah. colouring. Um, but yeah. Very, very good. Just landed in store yeah. today. Is there anything they can't do between this and picking up best everything in the world? Um, succession? Still haven't invited me to tour their new distillery <laughs> yet. Um, so that, that's a thing that needs to happen. Um, but yeah, something something that hopefully is, Delicious, is, is coming through yeah, soon. Very cool. um, but yeah, like there's huge amounts of experimentation mm. going on at Archie Rose. Obviously, we had the San Diego rye, which mm -hmm. is a domesticated rye. Um, uh, grow grown in in uh, New South Wales that we um, quickly sold out of the other week, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just I, I love that ability to, you know, there's no, like the word no doesn't happen yeah. in the Archie yeah, Rose yeah, experimental room. Yeah. Um, and we're hoping to get some of the uh, distillers actually on in the next couple of weeks onto a live stream somewhere here. Um, so um, yeah, it, I just love that idea of can we do this. Yes, we can. Let's yeah, let's go let's out and try it. and do it. Um, and even when they were doing some of their like um, their coast gins, some of the other limited releases, and they worked yeah. with professional foragers. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know there was a certain thing called professional foragers, <laughs> but they went out and found one and went around and a picked some awesome one stuff. They did was pretty awesome as well. A little while back, correct? Right? Yeah. Do you remember how they did that as well? No. So to make a smoked gin, what you would normally do is get some sort of botanical, throw it in, smoke it, and, and throw it in, or, or like wood smoke something, mm. and then throw it into the mix. No, 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 that was too easy. So what they did, they went to one of the restaurants just in the cannery in, um, in uh, uh, Rose, Rosebury, where they are, just down the road here. Uh, and they got, in one of the big ovens, got a block of ice, big block of ice, chucked it in there and then smoked the block of ice. So as the ice was melting, the water coming off it was lightly smoked. And that's what they used to cut the gin down to 43 or whatever it was. That's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Utterly... Ridiculous yeah. and unnecessary, but you know, <laughs> that's why we love Archie yeah. Rose. Yeah. Um, a few people coming in on the Facebook. Um, yes, uh, Crafty Field is there, and yes, Crafty, we are going to taste a few of your whiskies uh, very, very soon. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that. We haven't yeah. tried them yet, actually. We're flying in blind. I was going to say, yeah, off, off the cuff, in, in, in we go. It's going to be good. Uh, and Whiskey a Day says pens, and I do agree, pens are very important. Uh, the pens I'm using tonight are an Otto Hart fountain pen. Uh, in, Obviously, in in Germany, and yeah. then a um, a Schaefer uh, rollerball, which is it's a German brand, but made in China. But the ink that I'm running through it at the moment is French. Is there a terroir aspect in pens? There is, is actually. Sort of, I think it comes each from country the, has its own pen well, style. It's the ink <laughs> because because <laughs> using like pigments, and there's actually my next thing is when all those stalls opening, is go find some like Aussie inks. Yeah, right. Because apparently yeah. there's a few people up in the Blue Mountains making them and that sort of stuff. But um, Archie Rose. Yeah, Archie, yeah, yeah. Archie, Archie Rose, Rose Inc. Archie Rose Inc. We like it. I like it a lot. Um, so yeah, welcome to the uh, pen forecast <laughs> here, at, here at the Oak Barrel. Um, yeah, we, we need we need more conversations with more people than just me and you. I think because you're yeah. a little bit insane with that. I know this is I think it's maybe the twelfth time we've come come on to the pen topic. In yeah, yeah. twenty five <laughs> podcasts. Yeah, yeah. stop that. Okay. Give us something else to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, I like but, this. Um, yeah, this is this is great. I like it a lot. I mean, I think. Do you feel as though at some point there, like, you know, six, maybe 12 months ago, there was quite an influx of really sort of citrus forward, I mean, not, not necessarily bad, but incredibly approachable gins on the market? Um, yeah, yes and no. There was certainly, if we go back a long way, sort of like five years ago, 
that's when we saw a huge influx mm. of, you know, remembering companies like Four Pillars, are, you know, mm. who feel like they seem like they've been around forever, been here less than 10 years. Um, it's only really like someone like Stone Pine has been around for 12 years now, I think. Um, but yeah, about five years ago, there was a big influx of people throwing a lot of citrus, like mm. lemon myrtle and finger limes and that sort of thing. Um, at, at gins and there was probably a bit of palate fatigue for the Australian market for that um, and if you throw enough um, lemon myrtle and particularly the, the leaf of the plant at a gin you're going to get a pretty good citrus gin Yeah, it's, yeah. but it does dominate and you can get that sherbet in your notes and sometimes it can come off soapy as mm. well um, I think certain gum leaves as well can come off a little bit soapy in yeah, gins yeah yeah and you're going to lose that structure and that uh, even juniper yeah, yeah. yeah. so structure. I think and also people who had done it well, all of a sudden had a hundred new gins to compete with that maybe not doing it as well as they were, but up to a, but a they, reasonable they level. The same flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just became, well, why am I drinking this one instead of that one or this one? Because they're all, you know, taste relatively the same. So um, it has been, you know, just like any young industry, everyone went for that. Now it's shaking itself out a little bit. And, you know, using Horman's Orange, I um, mean, it, it's the, um, in the Hero Botanical here, it's the, um, the peel, fresh, mm -hmm. fresh peel. Um, and one of the best things you can do, again, is there anything Archie Rose can't do? If you go onto their website, there's a section of it called Spirit Data, mm -hmm. and you can go in and there, I think there's about 14 different botanicals in this that make up the whole mix, and they will tell you exactly where on the planet Earth it came from, whether it was fresh or dried. Um, so cool. Breakdown. It's just, it's awesome. It's proper, proper nerd stuff. Um, g'day again to David and or Caroline Taylor down in Launceston in there. Um, is anyone watching us on Instagram? Any questions there? Um, just a lot, a lot of pen talk. A lot of pen talk. I'm not gonna, That's good. Not going to um, encourage you with. <laughs> Wait, can we can we swap over? But, Go um, to the Instagram and just talk pens. Yeah, whoever does say, what's a solid, uncomplicated gin to gain an appreciation for? Which is an excellent question. Yes, I think. never, never. Yeah. Um, Anything or well, triple juniper? Tri tri triple juniper. Yeah. Um, it sort of ties in with what we were just saying there. Mm. We're using. We've got so much, you know, great flora. Um, such great produce here in Australia um, and such great citrus that we do get quite a wide varietal mm. and like a gin like this that is quite citrus driven juniper um, which is an integral ingredient you can't be called juniper doesn't have juniper in it is very fresh and piney and resinous so a lot of the British gins were down that track um, or the traditional styles of gins new markets come online like Australia and we start throwing all of our crazy botanicals at it and juniper is not the dominant flavour on here the citrus is Never Never um, mob down in uh, McLaren Vale in South Australia went back and so, so we can make a modern contemporary Australian gin where juniper is still the hero. Yeah. So there's you know hints of citrus and that sort of stuff, but they're triple juniper um, called so because they use juniper in three different infusions, basically macerated um, with the with the spirit. Then they put it in the bottom of the still when they're distilling, and then in a basket so the vapors actually go through juniper as mm. they're distilling um, is awesome. Yeah, and you can really eat. Cool. You can drink it neat, um, but why I suggest it is it's so versatile. It works in, um, you know, gin and tonics, Negronis, Martinis. However you want to use it, it's it's worth. It's very easily mm. usable. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, good. It's it's um, 500 ml bottles, so it actually brings the price point down a little bit as well, mm. which is which is quite good. Yeah, and there's so much flavor in there that you really don't need to go too over the top in any of your mixes or cocktails or anything like that. Um, comments coming in that says Moore's Archie Giaja at uh, Buy Local and I will throw Stone Pine in there as well 100% as yeah. one of my all time favourite gins um, yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah def definitely the, the Moore's film I actually have the privilege of sitting on the Australian Gin Awards tasting panel and you break out into little groups to have sort of you groups of three essentially and so you've got people from different parts of the industry so our little group for the last couple of years has been um, myself Phil Moore and Mikey Enright, who owns mm. Barbershop and Duke Clarence and those bars. Um, and it's fascinating. You, like, you sit down with Philip Moore for five minutes and you come away learning something brand new. Mm. Like, I'm talking about, oh, it's a bit citrusy and quite pine. It's got a bit of spice and all that sort of thing. And Phil's, like, rattling off the Latin names for him. Yeah. And going, oh, <laughs> they've boiled that at, you know, a degree too high and that yeah. sort of thing. It's just like, wow. Like, he is Levels. a pro proper yeah. wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, up, up north near, near Arena there. Uh, but, oh, there's, there's so many great gins. Yeah. Um, but also talking to um, Kangaroo Island last couple of days, uh, yeah, getting yeah. some of their stuff back in because they make excellent gins and they need a little bit of help with uh, bushfires. And then, come on, everyone, come visit us, spend some money in the local economy. 
Nope, don't do that either. So hopefully get some of that stuff back in. Um, uh, I'll be a big fan of the Manly, the Poor Toms mm. sort yeah, of stuff. Poor Toms. Um, and uh, Reggie, Reggie Paps is now uh, distilling at Manly as well, oh, yeah, which yeah. strengthens that team mm-hmm. further. Um, Caru, have we've done here Caru. so many times. Yeah. Caru, especially a hand sanitizer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Beautiful, um, beautiful, flavorful hand yeah. sanitizer. Uh, what do you say? T- Taz gins. Yeah, I actually like the one that I was I was gonna throw in uh, alongside Stone Pine was uh, the Poltergeist from Sheena State. Filtered uh, or unfiltered? Unfiltered. The, unfiltered. Is it the True Spirit? A True Spirit? A true Spirit is clean, then unfiltered is unfiltered. Maybe uh, both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Taz gins, Sud Polaire. It's uh, forty spotted. Yeah. Uh, look, it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, on and on. It's, it's a really tough thing, and there's so many out there and. You know, when I say, and we talk about buying local, 100%, but I don't want to cut out people like Kangaroo Island mm-hmm. and Tasmania and Victoria and Queensland, all these places make excellent gin as well. And um, it's it's a topic that comes up here quite a bit, is we've had a lot of these gins through uh, the store. You know, even from New South Wales, mm-hmm. you know, your wild Brumbries and yeah. Farmer's Wife and all this sort of stuff, excellent gins, but physically do not have the shelf space or, as a small business, have the ability to have the stock holdings. Yeah. To have a case of everyone's gin that we love, so we actually work, times. yeah, work in a bit of rotation here, which you know I feel a little bit guilty about sometimes as well because you got to knock people back who you you really not only love their their product but love them as people as well, mm. and it's like man, I got no space, we just need to turn things over. So gin, and I've got a as you well know sitting out the back there boxes and boxes of gins to just go through and try yeah, and that yeah. sort of stuff so it's uh, it's one of those good problems to have in terms of the um having the best job in the world it's just another perk but um you, you do sometimes get a little bit overwhelmed with the sheer amount and you know mm. someone will come in i've got a new gin great awesome let's come and show us like yeah there's seven different varietals of it it's like oh mate mm. just yeah let's double down on one yeah but um, no this yeah. is excellent big fan yeah arrived in store yesterday up on the website tonight um for a bit of fun but yeah i want to start with something a little bit lighter because i think we're going to start pretty pretty hot and heavy bit of, a bit of a journey on tonight's tasting panel isn't it yeah it's almost like we've planned one for the first time let's <laughs> <laughs> take it I think we've, had, we've had three days since monday to think of this yeah 20 25 goes at this and we've <laughs> finally worked out how to plan one properly um uh, and yeah awesome um you drink a lot of gin and tonics I do. I um, do. My, I'd say like gin and tonic is sort of the the go to outside of a, a glass of wine or yeah, which is beer it, on a hot day. Yeah, interesting because mm-hmm. obviously being the wine buyer, mm-hmm. your and I've noticed your go to, particularly if we're just hanging around the store, is a is a gin and tonic. Whereas mine will be to go to to a wine. Mm-hmm. When you're at home in isolation on long weekends with nothing to do, are you making gin and tonics at home? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I don't know. It's like it, it's that like. That cabin fever of having what the uh, the four day stint that we had, I mean, we see people doing it for a lot longer than that. But um, I've just, and I think we'll probably talk about it a little bit later tonight. Of just like, what haven't I drank in a while? What yeah. haven't I pulled out of the cabinet? What like you know maybe I want to try a, a, a tequila and tonic or a, you know a, something weird. But um, it is a good opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm also in the in the mindset of um, if it's not a, like so isolation based of just being like. Do I want to make sure I've got ice and the glassware and the gin and the tonic cold at home and then when I finish it I have to go downstairs and then get some more and then do it like that is seems yeah. quite laborious strangely um, and if anyone tuned in last week uh, which was last Monday Joe tried to teach me how to make a martini <laughs> um, which terrified all of the bartenders um, in right. Sydney yeah it was a good martini but yeah. like um, you, maybe we can talk about my attempts to make martinis over the weekend, home <laughs> alone, um, and, and how that went a little bit later as well. But I think it's whiskey time. Yeah. Um, if you're ready. So, uh, we have done a little bit of uh, tastings from Craftworks Distillery in previous. I know um, that he sent through a sample of the Rage whiskey, ah, whiskey previously. Um, and we're lucky enough that Crafty um, has sent us a, a few samples of new releases coming through. Um, that are just hitting the market now. I think they've gone up on his website the last couple of days. We're expecting them either tomorrow or, or Monday. Uh, uh, three new releases. Uh, one is uh, so the Capiti Celador release, batch two. Uh, Toke OK and Grumpy Old Man on a Hill. 
Now, <laughs> these arrived two or three days ago, they're little sample bottles, and I haven't tried them. I haven't noticed them, I haven't looked at it at all, um, which I know when I was speaking to Crafty a little bit earlier today worried him a little bit. But, <laughs> you know, that, that's what this is all about. We're going to take them um, as brand new and just sort of have a, have a go and mm -hmm. see what we reckon. Um, so the reactions will be quite honest. Um, which is the best way to do things. Yeah, I reckon so. Always film everything you do and upload it to the internet. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're going to rattle through some of the um, details and technical things about these whiskies pretty quickly. Um, but I actually have put some pre-orders up on the website that mm -hmm. do have some more information about casks and glass right. sizes and that sort of thing. So if you miss anything, it's, um, it's uh, you know, just jump on there. Crafty is scared. Good to hear it. And I, there's, <laughs> there's a few people jumping on the Facebook here. Um, Todd Painter, um, Michelle and Mark Burns, um, who run the fantastic uh, Aisling Distillery um, out in um, Griffith. Griffith, I think. My younger sister lives there now. I right, forget, okay. I forget. I'm sure it's Griffith. Um, anyway. Um, David MK, uh, Ross and I have our samples poured out and ready to taste with you. Lovely. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> I, I want some feedback from you guys well, So well. do we have an order? It's like, what, what, I'm, I'm going to make this up. Okay. Because um, it's lower ABV, the Capitine. Um, so we're going to start in the lower. Then I think Tokay, because I have a feeling. Oh, a bit more than that. Grumpy on Man on a Hill might have a hint of smoke. Now, for those playing at home who haven't... Um, I'm going to need more than that. Um, who haven't haven't come across uh, Crafty before? It's it's the Craftworks Distillery um, located out in Capiti, out uh, on the sort of the entry to the the mighty central west of New South Wales. Um, just out, you know, you get to Lithgow and head towards Mudgee, and it's about halfway there. Um, and you get to Capiti, the pub, Capiti Hotel, and out the back there is a distillery. Now, uh, Crafty Field, who runs the distillery, has been collecting whiskey new make and barrels and sort of matching whiskey, uh, sorry, new make and barrels for a couple of years now. So there's actually two sides to the, to the business. There's the the side that's been distilling whiskey and will very soon have two-year-old whiskey, I think, uh, if I'm getting my years right there. Uh, and then also this independent bottling arm. So this is, uh, the Capiti is uh, from whiskey distilled at other distillery. Um, a, a single distillery. Undisclosed. Undisclosed yeah. distillery. Um, I've got a little bit more information on the on the next two, mm -hmm. but this is coming from three barrels. Um, one was a Chardonnay cask, a bit of ex bourbon. I think ex bourbon. Better check my notes there. Um, and then just a, a little dash of uh, whiskey and a Botrytis cask. Okay. To give it a bit of spice. Now, the Capiti, and you can see on our website the logo, but you can sort of see it here a little bit, is a cellar door only release. It comes in 375 mil bottles for a little bit. You know, to again to, to bring the price down and to help like allow people to take away something if they go visit and drive through there. Um, obviously, there's no cellar door at the moment, and no one's travelling through. So, this second batch, this this vatting of the release, is um, sort of gone to is being you know made widely available. You can buy it on his website, it's sold to retailers, that sort of thing as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, and we can probably talk about this as we get into the other two a little bit later. But this is a creation. Um, we talk a lot about the concept of a single cask whisky, where one particular barrel in the warehouse is just singing and is just, you know, awesome. Um, and you, you don't want to mix it with anything. You don't want to lose that whatever it is special about that whisky. So release it as a single cask. But in a roundabout way, single cask whiskies are actually easier to make. Mm. If you've got a thousand barrels in your warehouse and you go through and taste all of them, you know, some that are... Uh, better some that are worse but you've got those barrels there you know you've lucked it out with a really shit hot barrel mm. and it's awesome if you had to go through those thousand barrels and make a product out of all of them that's the sum of its parts or you know better than the sum of its parts that's a really tough thing to do and it involves a lot more you know a, another skill set after mm. distilling so this is where i think uh the, the team at uh, craftworks really start to play around a little bit mm. um have a little bit of fun and um, you know, obviously this is their independent bottling arm, but I think this sort of thing is is really important in the Australian market and, you know, potentially will hold them in good stead for when they start blending their own stuff. So, uh, stone fruit is yeah. what I'm getting on the nose there. A um, little bit of like marmalade breakfast. Yep. In the air. I get, I get the aroma, but I wouldn't say it's... Um, 
you know how sometimes you can call particularly wines and mm. sometimes it's like jammy mm. I, I don't think it's no, jammy it's but it like has a, the yeah the flavor I think I'm profile thinking more of just like a I don't know like it, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty like wild out thing to say but like you can almost like, feel that Botrytis influence yeah um, my understanding it was it was a the Botrytis cast was actually quite a small cast mm. I think it was only 20 liters mm. um, that one and um so I think, and even though it's a, the whole thing hasn't gone into the vat, and I don't mm. know how big the, the mm. vatting is, um, but it is. Um, uh, yeah, it's it, it was just a little bit of a dash, and I think it, it if there's if you get that just that hint of spice on mm. the on the palate, that's what I think it's it's adding there. At least that's yeah. what um, uh, Crafty sort of said to me why he they they put that in. I um, really I'm really enjoying the nose. Yeah, but I can tell you so that. It was a 100 litre Chardonnay cask that was un, uncharred. Um, then you had the uh, 200 litre bourbon cask um, and then the 20 litre Botrytis cask that sort of um, right. that mi mixed together. Um, mm. it sells for about 105, mm. um, so about 90, 95 bucks for members at 48%, uh, sorry, 47.5%. honest mm. I really like it yeah yeah it's, it's kind of like we're coming off when we did Rage as mm. well I really liked Rage mm. which was ballsy single cast cast strength Pinot Noir probably my favourite Craftworks release to date I know that I'm not probably in the majority with that mm. and a lot of people don't rate wine casts at all mm. but I kind of do yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm young enough to want to get into drinking whiskey mm. properly you know sort of 10 years ago people were already starting to use red wine barrels to mm. mature scotch whiskey let alone australian whiskey so i've sort of my whiskey journey has grown up with a, a palette mm. you know appreciation for those things um and i just i love that mm. you know you know we know this is exactly what it is it's big it's 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 young so it's got that vibrancy mm. but it's got that sweetness mm. and it, it was a really muscular spirit this is a very different, this is much more restrained. I can see why with Cellar Door in mind, because mm. um, this is this is a bit more of a crowd pleaser. Which, uh, yeah, I was, I was like almost gonna say, it's kind of my, almost like my afternoon whiskey, a little bit, and it's kind of, which, you know, I quite like that, sort of, that sort of just pour and sip and, and enjoy and really just approachable, but that yeah. sweet yellow fruit, it's yeah. really forward. It's kind of got that like touch of baking spice, really energetic. Yeah. Um, a couple of comments in here. Mm. Oliver Marudo is putting in bush honey and plums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely the bush honey. Yeah, bush honey you see a lot of. Um, David and Kay uh, and the team there saying apricots, mm -hmm. hundred um, percent. Oliver jumps in again. Got a dry finish. Sticks up to off your palate with lingering warmth. Lingering warmth. Yeah, that's, a, see that. that's a nice yeah. lingering warmth. Um, mm. And, and Crafty himself does uh, pine in there, and if you are on the Instagram, I'm getting these comments from the Facebook if you can't see them. Um, the Botrytis was the salt and pepper in the batting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So just the, mm. I, I assume that means, A, for a little bit of that spice flavor, but also yeah, just yeah. That, that topping. Um, anything on Instagram? I can see them coming through. And you're yeah, like no, so, so we're... Um, do, do your job, mate. Well... Uh, the friends on I mean, Instagram right? so, someone here thought you just sit around drinking but whiskey no, the, the people on Instagram are actually talking to each other oh, that's so good. we're building yeah. a little community there <laughs> which is, is going well so what's happened um, is they've figured out whiskeyography says calling it now Betrytis and Toke are the next popular finishes for Australian whiskey mm. which I think is yeah. a very fair fair comment to make well that Sav Blanc um, Betrytis cast that Hobart did mm. that we did at Whiskey Fair last year and then we did on the, the tasting here mm. as well um, was really popular mm. um, it was on paper People were like, ooh, I don't know about that, but uh, really popular. Yeah, um, yeah that, was, that was excellent. Um, I'm like, this is like quite fun. Yeah. I really like it. It's like, it's just, yeah, really Moorish. I can drink a lot Which of is not a term that I throw against whiskeys that often. Yeah. Not because I find whiskeys challenging to drink. I just don't think you really get a Moorishness out of, out of um, that often, out of barrel aged spirit. Yeah. I think if you haven't been to the Craftworks Distillery, so mm -hmm. you haven't tried the, the Capitia release before, and you've tried Black Soul Beast, Lager Cat, yeah. Just Derek, Rage, these other, big, other abrasive. Yeah. This is going to be okay. Well, that's a bit mm. different. Technically, proficiently, probably a better whiskey. 
I can yeah. I can taste molten things. The Chardonnay cask is really well managed. I'm a sucker for ex bourbon barrels, so there's mm. a bit of that in there. Um, you know, technically a very pleasing whiskey, mm -hmm. but very very different to what we've tried before, and I dare say what we're about to try as well. Well, and that's always interesting, and it's interesting that it's coming from someone like Crafty as well, because you know, in the times that I've tasted whiskey, many a time has been you know just the three of us sitting around drinking and analysing. A lot of it though has been at um, like whiskey the Wild Rover and and the Wild <laughs> Rover and and events like that where if you're running around or you're trying to like get to all your favorite distilleries and still have chats and you know drink your water at the same time blah 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 it's the same in a lot of wine events that we host and you know we attend at the same time um, it's not necessarily drinks like this that you go well like yeah this is this is immediately ple pleasurable when you've got your palate working over time it takes something like a black soul beast or a rage where you're tasting it in that you know big day of whiskey tasting and it goes oh yeah okay i can feel that yeah whereas things like this might get lost amongst the the chaos of, of those events um but sat on your back back porch or you know in front of the tv or something slipping away at this it's be awesome i reckon i've thought more about this whiskey than i have from any other these releases mm. and I mean that in terms of bottled releases has been like new makes and car mm. that we've sat down and really analyzed but this one is the one that I'm thinking the most about and it's changing very quickly I mean we have to remember as well that these just went into bottle last week basically so ideally we'd be trying them in about two or three weeks time when they've had a little bit of time to acclimatize with that and I think that's why I'm seeing quite a big change because mm. I'm seeing a lot more of that bourbon cask influence coming through now. And what, so what, what sort of characteristics would you see in whiskey just, just settling? Like you see certain flavours die off and some pick up or you'd see Not things much. soften out? or Yeah, it's more of a, a texture and a, and a balance thing. Right. Um, you know, you, you tend to get like a lot of you know, high ethanols and that sort of like nose, mm. nose hair burning thing can happen sometimes. Um, Whiskies that have had a little bit more time to sit in the barrel will calm down a bit. Mm -hmm. I know. We saw that with our Paul John single cast yeah, that we yeah, imported. Yeah. And that, that took, after it got off the, off the boat, off the docks, off the truck here to the oak barrel, I reckon that got better for about six months. Yeah, right. And mm. I know uh, Tim Duckett from Hartwood, when he, he's doing a tape thing, he'll send bottles up um, from Tassie about, you know, up to a month, you mm. know, three at least three weeks in advance, mm. so they can sit here, get off a plane or whatever they've been, you know, shipped up in, yeah, yeah, and just sit here for for a little while. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah, and it, I mean, we're not talking about open bottles because oxidization, you know, mm. does improve some whiskies as well, um, and they open up. But yeah, definitely. But yeah, that's something to remember. I think that's maybe why I'm seeing quite a bit of uh, development mm. there. Um, but very good crafty. Um, that's a real thinker. I drink like. This seems like a weird thing. I drink whiskey for fun, mm. you know, and I like. I think that's what, the, particularly the independent bottlings that we've seen so far. They are fun whiskies. They're unashamedly what mm. they are. Australian climate, mm. youthful, zippy, bright things. Um, this one, you know, this is one that I would sit down with to go. Okay, yeah. I want to think about a whiskey. I'm going to sit down and think about this one. But and it's also what I quite enjoy about this. It'd be like it'd almost be a whiskey that I would take to. A mate's place, or like taken in serve to a few of my friends that mightn't be the biggest whiskey fans in the world, and like, you know, the concept of Australian whiskey is just so terrifying to walk into a bottle store and try and pick one. Where it's just kind of like, all right, we'll just sit down and, and drink this, and let's just go about the day. Yep, like, um, love it, love it. Yeah, and another thing, like, that's a bit of a window as well. Mm. Is that because that's the flavor profile they're creating themselves? It's the same team that's going to be creating a flavor profile with their own stuff when that comes about yeah absolutely and when they decide to release that okay 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 so um this again an independent bottling from uh crafty field and craft works this is from an undisclosed distillery in southern new south wales um undisclosed not really for any you know negative reason mm. but just this particular distillery hasn't released their own product yet um and that's 100 percent understandable that you would want your introduction to your market to be your own um, your own product. Um, what I can reveal though, it is the same spirit that was in the Rage. Okay. Which I obviously quite liked. Mm. So I'm expecting something a little bit more, you know, on that, you know, it had that sweetness up front, but muscular, but we're talking about a 100 litre Tokay cask. Mm. We're at 54% alcohol here. Um, 
Uh, yeah, Fre French oak uh, Toke cask, uh, 230 bottles in this run. Um, so we can have a look at this now. Yeah, um, and Crafty does jump there, so he says directly to you, Joey, it's designed to be easy and approachable for new drinkers, yet have some complexity for seasoned drinking. And I think, yeah, I think he smashed it. I think it does yeah. what it says on the tin. Yeah. Um, and also we, uh, you know, it's not, we went, it wasn't really designed to be, you know, drunks amount mm. us, you know, analyzing it to the eighth degree, probably because it was that one you try whiskeys, mm. you take it away. It's a bit of, you know, KPD that you can mm. take home with you. Um, and also, um, if anyone's out there wants to think, is it Capiti or Capiti? Um, I've had Capiti. Well, see, I've had or well, presumed locals tell me both, um, and then someone who uh, uh, from Mudgy I was speaking to uh, today actually came into the store uh, said uh, Capiti. So, yeah, yeah I, mean, I was like, oh, okay, hold on, I have to step back and reevaluate my life choices there. Um, okay, but first knows on this. Do we know how long it's in the barrel for? Uh, well, over two years. Okay. Uh, yeah. being, well, to, to be, be whiskey, to be whiskey. Yeah. Um, We don't, and to be honest, I don't really care. No, it's just, it's inter like, yeah, it would just be interesting to see. So I, I would say, that... you know, less less than four years. Yeah. Um, not on any flavor profile, but mm. just from, from my understanding, that's when... Um, Crafty started collecting barrels and that sort of thing, but again, you know, what do what do we have here? Three releases coming out now. What are we coming out of? Summer. Mm. So, obviously, barrels develop a lot quicker in the summer months. Um, so, you know, this could be. I would be more interested to see whether this is three summers or two summers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I think. So probably three three summers on this one. And just on that first node. Um, I think I was like, "Yep, okay, we're back a lot, to a lot of talk, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're, we're back to crafty territory yeah. with those those big, brash, bold releases that we we, we know." Um, now, Joey, uh, you know, Toke mm -hmm. is something that we know a little bit about. But mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about exactly what Toke is? It's a, it's a fortified. Yeah, so just essentially a fortified, often in this country, capitalised um, sweet wine. Yep. So, so you'll pick the grapes very late, or you'll sort of dry out the grapes and. Um, Often you're adding uh, sugar must to, to sort of bring it up. Um, so it's normally it floats around sort of between sort of 15 to 22 percent ABV, but um, a, 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 a sticky, you know, yep. I think it's, it's your classic Australian sticky wine, yeah, um, done in that, in that fashion. So that's been time in a barrel, and yeah, high, high sugar, high glycerol, um, a high ABV. So I'm assuming that has a big influence on the, the barrel itself. Um, and in part to invite flavour, and uh, sherry. Th this is a really yeah. hard and a real shit question to ask you because mm. there's no, you have no idea of answering <laughs> this. But in general, is Toke something you keep in a barrel for twenty four months or or ten years? I know, like sherry, it can be twelve months, yeah, or, or it can be you can know, run, fifty you years. You can run Toke like a Solera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I put I spend its life in a barrel, um, depending on how how. Um, concentrated you wanted to make that and how complex um, yeah okay we have so, some yeah that we that we run through a Solera here in the store um, and yeah you just the longer that it's there the the, the deeper and, and richer it becomes um, yeah so, so again so we, we don't know uh, yeah. the provenance of this particular mm -hmm. barrel but it, it could go you know either way it could, yeah, yeah. could have been soaked through it could have been you know a little bit lighter but again coming from um, the Tasmanian Cars mm -hmm. Company, and there is a note here that this was quite heavily charred. Mm -hmm. So what you're getting in a, in a heavy char barrel is when you obviously throw flame through the middle of it, and it, it breaks breaks up the oak, um, and you get that sort of alligator skin happening, and it means that the whiskey and the spirit can get into those mm -hmm. nooks and crannies and get deep into the oak um, and, and bring out that flavour. And a good question here on Instagram from Whiskeyography, again, is how are the tannins on the Toke OK? Which... Probably is a, like is that something that gets brought up a lot in whiskey? I mean, imagine in, in heavy red wine casks and in sherry casks yeah. and stuff, you might talk about the the tannin sort of chewiness or or, or dryness through there. Yeah, we we um, see it a lot in the um, twenty liter cask yeah. fascination yeah. that Australia yeah. seems to have had um, to get whiskey up very quickly. Where unfortunately some releases in a twenty liter cask yeah. probably were ready at about eighteen months. Yeah, yeah. So you get that dry tannin. This is a hundred liter Toke mm -hmm. cask, so. I don't get a huge amount of tannin on the nose. Mm. I w if you hadn't brought it up, I probably wouldn't have said tannin. 
No, I, and I, I, go, I go looking like, for it. It's to, there. To, Tokai but isn't necessarily a style that you'd gravitate. Like you'd, you'd go looking at Big Town and Out. Like they're certainly there um, in certain expressions. Um, but I think this is more. This plays more into that almost like sort of turnsy world. Yeah, a I, little I'm, bit. I'm like that honey, like a PX uh, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. When you said sort of turns, I was like, mm. yep, mm. yeah, because I'm, I'm getting a lot of like deep honey, particularly in that like couple of minutes that let that initial, you know, let it settle mm. in the glass. The, the mid palette here is what I find the most interesting. Should try it. Yeah. Comes into this kind of like baked like walnut thing, like this almost like 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 chocolate bar like. Um, you know, lingering note mm. in there, which is super fun. I do like that spirit. It's got that, again, yeah. very pretty nose. Mm. I would say probably has a little bit more depth than what the Rage did. Mm. The Rage was bang, mm. this is what we are. Um, and it was a you know a bit more of a one trick pony. I loved mm. it, but that's what it was. This is a little bit yeah. more layered. But you still. Honeycomb, have... lots of. Mm. It's still a very muscular sort mm. of mouth coating spirit. Like the yeah. mid palate has a lot of, you know, it's very broad mm. to me. Um, also, like that brioche, that kind of toasted bread yep. thing. Um, Crafty's come up with a tasting note that I actually mm. just saw um, on his on his own notes that he mm. sent me the information that said very marmalade, um, which is funny because we were talking about marmalade in, in the previous one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I so, said like I think in the previous one, when I immediately jumped at marmalade, I was thinking like bright orange fruit. Yeah. Okay. And then I think when we probably most people think of, I don't eat a lot of marmalade, but more of a, 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 a you know, a, a, a compote, like a jam type thing, yeah. like, a, this, like, a, like a spread over toast kind of thing. This is a, a thicker whiskey, so it yeah. has more of that jammy hmm. nature that I was saying I didn't find in, in the previous one. So, um, which if you come through again on the, the tannin comment, it says that the top guys and betrayers will be low on tannin, yeah. which is, is um, that does make a lot of sense. Uh, similar to Sword Turns Nectar Door territory, which yes. is the Glen Morangy release. Yeah, Glen Morangy yeah. release uh, Nectar Door, which is a Turns cast finish. And, um, I you mean, know, I get, yeah. um, it's a little bit, I mean, it's, it's a bit, much bigger. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, I mean, it's, it's an Aussie whiskey. It's an Aussie whiskey, <laughs> it's uh, 54 exactly, or is it 50, yeah, 54 mm. exactly percent. Um, and, you know, Glen Morangy famously have one of the most delicate light spirits. The, the tallest stills in mm. Scotland, the spirit works incredibly hard mm. to a very, tall thin neck or, you know um, to, to get up and over um, so very very delicate spirit and that's why you know those 12 year old Los Santas mm. Nick Dador, you know um, Quinta Rubin and the Port Sherry and Saturns finishes they're finishes because you mm. couldn't you couldn't put it into a Saturns cast go, for 12 yeah, years yeah. you would you would just mm. crush the spirit um, whereas this um, yeah same same new makes so same new makes actually okay because I didn't wasn't too sure with the the Capiti, whether that mm. was it was obviously a single mop, but whether mm. it was the same um, distillery, but it's actually the same distillery um, for this one. Probably wouldn't have picked that. Two two quite different mm. whiskies. Um, question here on the Facebook: um, How is it drinking at fifty four percent easy? What does it do with a touch of water? Um, is drinking very very well. Do we have water? I think we've only got vodka. Um, that's a very good question. Um, but yeah, I didn't didn't actually lean towards putting any water with this. But let's just grab a bit of that water over there. You know, we we're being very untechnical, and we have, we, yeah, almost <laughs> just like that. Just gonna, just no gonna, one, no one saw that. Then. Just gonna drown this yeah. a little bit, so this might kill it. Um, but I, I, I like it at fifty four. Yeah, and like, I do, to be honest, with the with the little the warm up on the first one, I think just to really get those those taste buds um, running, like I I did like it. Like I just I got, like you said like it's just the layers. Yeah, just the layers and layers and layers that just kept coming through. This brings out like immediately. I get. I mean, maybe it's we just put this poor whiskey into you know just hyper, it, hyper yeah. shock with the amount of water we just threw at it. Um, more oak mm. comes through initially after the water added. After the water yeah. added. I mean, we've, and I'd already drunk a bit, so I probably, yeah. what I might do actually just top up with whiskey just to just to even things out. Um, this is this is such a cool whiskey, though. Yeah. And different yet, like going back to, I forget who made the comment on Instagram there about like new new barrels, and he's a bit kind of, you know, you know these Tokay Petritus, these sort of fortified casts, they're going to become the new norm. Probably not because there's physically not enough of them around yeah. to, you know, bring out a you know a we big don't drink enough of that. Yeah, exactly. So you won't see like Lark or Starwood come out with a core line Petritus cask, mm -hmm. I don't think. Um, but um, I think 
the perception of whether those whiskies or those barrels can make world class quality whiskies, I think 100% will, will change and will evolve that way. Um, and I, yeah, I think we both agree with Oliver on the Facebook there that um, exactly the right ABV. This, at 54. At 54. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is cool. Um, it's actually something we spoke about on our um, whiskey roundtable last night with various people from around the, the country. And my personal opinion, and this is just like some whiskies better higher, some lower, but on average, over the thousands of whiskies I've tried, the ones I tend to remember best are somewhere between 46 and about 51. And that 48, 49% seems to be my sweet spot on average, not of a whiskey, you know, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, but yeah, so I quite like this. Um, I would prefer this at 54, I think. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, also, I just think like it just had so much to give at 54. Yeah. Like it, it's almost, it's it, like after that, it just, it feels uh, like with the water, it feels a little bit thin. Yeah. Yeah. With what, like everything that was going on at 54%. In, immediately adding a little bit more whiskey back into it, it's plumped mm. it up again. Mm. It's got mm. a bit of that body and that spunk back. Um, again, it's not a to sort of characterize it it's like the the rage and you know the just Derek they mm. were they were intense mm. again this is a little bit more considered a little bit more restrained but there's a little bit more going on in here certainly would I like I had so much fun drinking the rage um, would I say that I prefer this over the rage pretty neck and neck but there's more layers in this yeah there's yeah, more yeah, going on here yeah I just I really like that that nutty that like toasted walnut thing that's going on like it's yeah, yeah. um a couple of uh things there solution drink more toke 100% um exactly old, old do, Kempton, do that yeah old Kempton did a toke mm. um and we're actually um as Joey said we've got a couple of barrels mm. 20 litre barrels that have been here for about 20 years now one with a musket one with a toke mm -hmm. that we need to find someone who's got some mature whiskey um just yeah. really quick in and out yeah are we gonna reckon <laughs> those, about those two, casks are so dense two months and it'll be yeah. like it won't last two years mm -hmm. two months um and another couple of questions here um yeah so take a okay cast in may 2017 and just bottled so yeah you're sort of looking at three three, three years, summers yeah, yeah. Almost on the nose yeah um and Zeno comes in Starwood as a new world project using a cognac barrel i remember that mm -hmm. that one um and by the way, Scotty, how is your pen game tonight? Mate, you're a little bit late. We did spend about half an hour talking about pens yeah. before. And Joey's banned me from talking about pens I to, anymore. I had to stop all pen chat. But, uh, yeah, Otto, just Otto Hutt from Germany on the uh, fountain <laughs> and a, 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 a Schaefer for the uh, rollerball tonight. So again, a price on the Tokyo OK? Price, it's sitting at about 195 on the shelf. So 175 for members, pretty much on the nose. I think it's 175 50. 500 ml water. If, yeah, if you buy it tonight, I'll refund you 50 cents. How's that? <laughs> there you go. Look at that. Um, yeah, Actually, as, discount. As, as I did say at, at the start, if, if you miss anything we're saying um, about some of the technical aspects, we have put up some pre orders on the website. That whiskey, does, not pens. Yeah, whiskey, yeah. yeah. We can talk about pens if you want. But um, that does have a bit of that technical information, and you can see the, the bottle labels and, and that sort of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, no, uh, well done, Crafty. I like that. And well done to whoever distilled that spirit. I'm still liking that spirit. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to go back and have another look at the Capiti after this, mm. now knowing that it's the same spirit. Um, yeah, that is an interesting look. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Khaleesi comes in and says, we did the bourbon whiskey tasting. It was really good from last night. That was good fun. I, I did that as well, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At the back Me of the too. Yeah. Um, it was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, incredible value in hindsight, that one as well, with like mm. two whiskeys, uh, three whiskeys, 50% and above. Mm -hmm. um, one as high as 63%, which you can't buy for love nor money in Australia at the moment. Yeah. For, you know, 50 bucks or 45 bucks delivered. Yeah. I was like, man, I should have charged more for that. <laughs> okay. Mr. Mr. Trick there. Uh, and then we've got, can I buy the Rutherglen Tokyo barrel you have near the window? No. <laughs> no, that's the one I'm talking about. We're keeping that. That's that's for us. Um, You'd probably nick it if you tried. Ah, uh, it's full though. Yeah, it's heavy. It's and heavy. any clues to the distillery? Also, no. Um, Southern New South Wales, they haven't released uh, their own whiskey yet. Um, I'm going to leave it at that um, because, you know, that would, wouldn't be fair to, to, to them. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to note it's not a... You know, big fan of transparency. 
mm. and certainly Crafty has been as transparent as possible. Has probably even given too much away by saying Southern New South Wales <laughs> and haven't released their own thing in the same as, as the Rage. Um, but yeah, that, that's not really my uh, my my thing to, to share there. Um, and you know, obviously I have a guess, but I might even be wrong. So um, can can speculate, but uh, I'm not going to throw too many names mm. out there. Um, However, careful listeners is all I'm going to say to tonight's stream. Careful, careful listeners. Um, someone should grab some musket, take a barrels from the rubber gun and chuck some new make in them. Some of the best fortifiers in the world. Chris Drake goes, yes. Um, yeah, and that's that's exactly where our um, fortifiers yep. that we sell by the, the leader here, you know, Solera, um, are from. But yeah, uh, in the in the 20 litre formats, and they, they were never designed to fill whiskey though, mm. 20 years ago to house toke and musket so they just wouldn't last two years yeah. so that's why for those barrels we need something that is ideally you know a mellow i would love a refill three or four year old mellowed you know ex-bourbon cask yeah, from yeah. somewhere yeah. just to give it a jab and you could use it like four or five times i reckon it's yeah. that it's that um thick one of the um actually one of the best fortifieds i had had in a long time uh, I think it was some point last year, maybe the year before, um, from um, Ian Croucher at North Star. Yes, yes. Do you remember that, that Montier that uh, Pedro Jimenez released? That I think he was using the sherry purely to season barrels to put whiskey into. Yeah. And decided to bottle the sherry, and it was unreal. It's, it's so good. It's an Australian thing. The Australian market loves it. Ended up yeah. like bottling a few of them just for Australia. It was it was a, and the, one of the best ones was he he had. An Isla whiskey in it. Mm. It was either one of the Kalilas or the Ardbeg or something, and then wanted to reseason mm. it, and so put you in there for just like a year, and came out. So you had this Isla Cask PX, yeah. which was which is unbelievable. Maybe um, we can go full circle here one day in Australia, and have the fortified wineries buying barrels of whiskey. Yeah, uh, yeah, whiskey distilleries. It's already it's already happening. I know, and I I mean, the Lark ownership has changed quite a bit in the past, you know, five years, but definitely. You know, in the past ten years, they've done deals mm. with wineries and wine regions um, for a pair up sherry and tawny and port and that sort of stuff, and said, "We're going to use them for five years. We're going to give them back to you for five years, then give them back to us for five years, yeah. and they're just going to rotate through." So cool. Breweries are doing a lot. Yeah, um, uh, I know. You know, a lot of uh, whiskey um, barrel aged beers were on. You know, for various beer shows mm. that were going to happen in the next couple of months, and now being pushed back a bit. Um, alternatively, then you get the stout and you know porter cast back mm. to mature your whiskey in. So, a bit of that going on as well. Um, do you want another whiskey? I'm still drinking. Yeah, we're, which one are we up to? Um, we're going quite long tonight, but that's all right. Yeah, smoky fortified. I like it. Um, I did hear a um, a rumor that Crafty might be uh, not Crafty. Um, Ian Crafty might be playing around with some more PX. Based purely that the Australian market wants it. No one else in the world is interested, apparently. We we'll, will take we'll, all of we'll it. We'll take it all, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll take an allocation just from my house. Do you want to pour some old men on the hill? Yeah, so this is old men on the um, The first maybe one. whiskey that we can, um, yeah, wash it out a bit of water. We can actually reveal where this uh, spirit was distilled because uh, Marty Pie at the Riverborne Distillery has released um, whiskey to the market. Um, and I think that if Crafty ever did something bad and released a bad whiskey with the Riverborne, you know, disclosure behind it, Marty would just rock up his house and sort of yell at him. So I don't think he's too worried about how this comes out. Do you say you think this might have had have some smoke on it? There was some suggestion. Why, yeah, I, think why you, I think you might be right. Why I'm doing this, I mean, I haven't tried these, but why I'm doing this last is because, um, talking to some people, they said, um, Yes, it is. it's either peated or there's some smoke influence in it. So I'm not 100% sure. I know it's another um, single cask bourbon. Uh, so it's single cask bourbon, uh, heavy char bourbon. So sometimes you can get a little bit of that like um, tobacco leaf smoke from a, a heavily charred barrel. Um, yes, um, Peter Bignall, who was on our whiskey round table last night, um, talking about that Starwood cognac cask. Mm -hmm. um, was really good for memory. Uh, yes, I agree. Um, and Crafty Phil, team to what we were just saying, he's got relationships with all, like and building relationships with both breweries and wineries um, to develop casks. Um, okay, so this is 100% Scotch peated. So I'm gonna say Baird's malt. So Scottish malt, 
right. that's been peated in, in like with Scottish peat uh, that's come over here, been fermented and brewed okay, here. Okay, right. So right, instead right, of okay. using a strain, yep. malt and strain peat. So um, Baird's malt seems to be the one that a lot of people uh, use. Um, is it Plum and Plumber, Sutherland's Cove second fill barrel release comments? Haven't tried it yet. Hoping to get some arrive here next week. Mm. And I'll be uh, to to talk about that. But um, yes, Baird's Malt is using um, traditionally, and same with Simpsons out of the UK, um, a Highland peat rather than mm. an, an Isla peat. So it's a little bit more earthy. Um, anyone that tuned into our peated uh, tasting two nights ago, we, we talked a lot about terroir and you know you get to talk about soil in wine and i don't yeah except when we're talking about peats i get to talk about <laughs> as much soil as i want um so grumpy man on a hill named after martin pie because he is a grumpy man uh <laughs> and he lives on a hill um big hit at whiskey fair last year martin pie yeah the, the riverborne whiskies. yeah yeah um yeah. i was drinking their splash wine earlier actually yeah, and people actually voted with their feet. We sold everything they brought down. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't bring down a huge amount because they didn't have a huge amount to mm. sell, but everything they brought down, we, we sold um, on, on the night. So, okay, let's jump in. While we, yeah, okay, while we get on the nose, we've got also, yeah. Tough time to launch a whiskey, get behind crafty, absolutely. Hashtag buy local and sign me up to that Pedro Jimenez allocation. I, mean, I think you need to get on the phone to hold in and come yeah, well, yeah, some cherry barrels. Ian, Ian, Ian via Scotty. Mm-hmm. Um, the wine about gives a wave also. G'day wine about, how are you doing? Mm, okay, yeah. It's a sweet smoke. Yeah, what a, like maple bacon? Yep, yep, mm. that sort of, mm. um, like that honey smoked ham thing yeah, yeah. as well. It's yeah, a similar thing, you've ever had the Ben Maria Curiositas, their 10 year old yeah. um, Peter. Yeah. Obviously quite different, but there's similarities there mm. in terms of the, the smoke profile. So with this, this peat, that they peat with that's from the highlands or from isla yeah yeah it, it, no it, it peats from the highlands, well, from the highlands at least right. at least mainland scotland so i've always like noticed a difference between isla peat and highland peat. oh hugely yeah, different yeah hugely one's like different. salt and one's yeah. like and you know it is it is matter in the ground so yeah. it's it's the vegetation you have around which is determined by the climate you're in there's no trees on mm. isla because it's windswept and nothing can, can grow um you can uh, you know i've cut peat I've been lucky enough to cut peats both um, with Laphroaig on Isla and with Lark in Tasmania. And in Laphroaig, it's, you know, quite wide and opened. Mm. And even though you might be, you you know, a kilometre away, nothing's a kilometre away, but like a little while away from the sea, you can still see and smell the ocean. Mm -hmm. You know, it it comes in. On Lark, or sorry, at Lark in the Tasmanian Highlands, um, you're on a paddock. Mm the cow paddock and you push the cows out of the way to get to your peat bog and that sort of thing so two completely different environments two completely different you know vegetal matter you know composting there you get two completely different types of peat mm. so um yeah this is quite interesting to use a a scot and I, i'm speculating about exactly where the malt comes from but it comes from somewhere in from one of the scottish malting houses and they'll be getting a peat from somewhere in the highlands um yeah, again, I, and this is what you love about independent bottlings. And I think when you, you look at, obviously, this is a small version of the bottles that we're talking about here. The big bottles are the same. They've got that same style label. Um, Crafty is, is the man mm. behind them. But we have, you know, now five or six completely different whiskies in terms of Pinot Noir casks, Port casks, Sherry casks, Peated, Tokay casks, but all made by the same person mm. So and, and the same team down there. So... Even though there is, you know, whiskies that are at completely, you know, opposite ends of the whiskey flavor profile spectrum, there's common threads mm. because the same team, the same flavor profiles are choosing this whiskey. So, I think that's why I found the first one a bit of a curveball. Yeah. Just knowing the, the sort of the, the history of the craft folks releases and then, you know, almost take, taken aback by the least yeah. intense whiskey of the night. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, a, Good point. That's something I was about to touch on from um, from David M K. Is that it is it's delicate, mm. and it is really delicate. And I think that's probably what's got me across. Even the Toke is a little bit more restrained than some of the other releases. Mm. It's laid. It's sort of going. Yeah, there's there's things to discover here, but you're going to work for it. Like um, particularly, uh, you know, Just Derek was big, but Black Soul Beast and Rage. They were like, this is here. 
and we're going to yell and scream at you about what we're about. And you, I guess you, you get on that train and you go, I like this or I don't like this. And, and that's a pretty immediate yeah, reaction. Yeah. This is, uh, there's a lot, there's a bit going on here. I haven't taken there's a, a sip yet. I haven't taken a sip yet. So we get a two, two breweries jumping in. Little Alchemist Brewing Lab with a thumbs up and Beach Beer Bondi with two of the best looking blokes in the biz and you are on the wrong live stream yeah I think what you've done there <laughs> is you've got your Instagram camera and you've you've actually looking at yourself that one but that that uh, Bondi draft has yep. got me through uh, a lot of the current isolation yeah and we actually spoke about it not last live stream but the live stream before some of the best looking beer cans yeah because, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I because, last yeah and it's, yeah, it's yeah. another isolation thing yeah. I've been watching a lot of like old sporting events yeah and so you get that like 80s, 90s, um, like cigarette advertising over everything, <laughs> particularly like motorsport, and they have nailed that sort of. So um, good, so good. Yeah, it's same that um, like Dust Juice did it as well. The, yeah, and every time I walk past it, I'm seeing like, oh, Formula yeah. One car from the 80s, which so like you know, <laughs> Bathurst 76. I can I can see yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and yes, a, a quick point from Daniel Hopper. I have been saying, obviously, Crafty is the mm. face of Craftworks Distillery, mm. but a couple of people have picked up. They've been saying Team a lot, um, and yes, I just mean the Todd. Uh, because Todd works with Crafty, and mm. so when I say the team, I mean both of them. Uh, our live stream's gone down. Does that mean we have to go again? I think so. I think so, yep. Yeah, you can only go for so long. Sorry, bear with us, Facebook. This this new um, Instagram technology is is keeping us interested. It's built We're for, back. It's built for millennials. We don't know yep. the concentration I'm span. Way, way too old for this. <laughs> way too old for this. Um... Um, in but, fact, at the Todd, the Todd has jumped on there, um, saying loving the feedback on the releases, guys. Well, I mean, like, at the end of the day, we have the easiest job in the world. We need to sit here and drink these great whiskeys, and I think it's important to do like a shout out to to Todd and and Crafty, and you know, we're all over eighteen here because we're drinking whiskey and talking fun. What a fucked up year! Fires, yeah. and you know, particularly <laughs> in Capiti, they had the Gospers Mountain Fire from one end when they just think that's getting over them another one lights up behind them basically circled by fire tourism done then okay let's do it let's get people out into regional areas throughout new south wales throughout victoria covid stay at home don't travel definitely don't go to regional areas yeah because if you do it there they don't have the you know um the hospital and, and healthcare facilities to deal with that so stay at home it's fucked up so um for you guys holding on and doing as much as you can we really appreciate it yeah. um and hopefully we can, uh, you know, hold on with, with you guys and then, you know, send some people out there. Um, we were talking in February, I don't know if you remember, I think it was at Old Mates up at the top of the rooftop there, talking about maybe we could do some like oak barrel tours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Go yeah. do like, you know, sell tickets for X amount and do, you know, Capiti, stay night in Mudgee, then do another night, you know, Orange, maybe do like a long weekend sort of thing. Um, and it was a good idea at about like you know one a.m. at old mates, <laughs> and then we woke up and I was like, that looks like a lot of that looks like a lot of work, a lot of driving, a lot of driving, a lot yeah. of work, um, and a lot of like being responsible for other human beings when we yeah. can barely be responsible for ourselves. Um, but I think maybe when this is all cleared in twenty twenty one, it might be something we need to revisit. Mm. And I'm sure we can work with people who are um, better better at this than, than we are, um, and and maybe come up with something to just sort of. To give, cool. give back a bit. Um, I like this a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think? I it's think just like it, it quite like it's really a persistent whiskey. I think like it, you sort of like it's not like massively up in your face, but it also just doesn't like you know fade away without without letting you know. Yeah. 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 Um, I just want to give a quick wave to Hobart whiskey. I don't know if you were on before, but. Um, we uh, did do a shout out because we, we were talking about the Tokay cask, that Semyon Blanc Petritus cask that was bottled for Fair last year and that we've done on this stream as well. Um, a really good example of these sort of casks mm. doing, doing very well. Um, but yeah, I, mm. I'm not really a big fan of picking winners, um, but if you had a gun to my head and said you can only drink one whiskey left on your last, last night alive, I think I'd lean to Grumpy Old Man. Yeah? I reckon, I'm really enjoying this. It's, it's soft, it's, it's eloquent, um, which, you know, is pretty unlike crafty, you know, yeah. being un understated and mm. gentle and, you know, slow to reveal their true intentions. Um, definitely unlike crafty. Um, there's not much of this from memory. 
we're going to go back to my little notes here. Uh, 100 litre, yeah, single cast bourbon cast, Kevy Char, 158 bottles at 53.8. Um, so, you know, pretty much as good as, you know, 54 for the Tokay, okay. Um, yeah. Um, like it. I'm, I'm going to go the other end. Actually, I think my pick of the night was the Cape D. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Purely in the in the mindset of, like, I enjoyed them all. I'm going to really enjoy, you know, Grumpy Old Man when you and I sit in here drinking a drama tree. I'm going to be taking a bottle of that home and showing it to all my friends. Yeah, okay. And yeah. drinking it with them. Yeah. This, yeah, this We're one. We're not friends, obviously. Yeah, so. no. I have, I have lots of friends <laughs> outside of the Oak Barrel that aren't suppliers or customers. I definitely have friends uh, that aren't that. Um, and it's, it's a big, as we sort of like start to wrap up um, the crafty part of proceedings, um, there is some other people I think that he's posting on the Facebook that we should probably thank as well. Um, Mrs. Crafty, Andrea, uh, reality check manager. I think probably manager in more ways than ones rather than just reality <laughs> checks. Um, uh, Kathy, who is the artist, um, the daughter Abby, um, who did Black Soul Beast and Lager Cat, and she's retired at nine. She's given up. She's packed it in. Well, to me, Black Soul Beast was probably my favourite whiskey label of all time. So. Yeah. Um, well, I got the t-shirt. Yeah. Been there, drank that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> um, which is cool. I, I think um, perhaps my personality might get better with a grumpy old man on a hill t-shirt. But, um, yeah. But that's all right. Um, so thank you very much, Crafty, for, mm -hmm. for sending us these samples. These whiskies are available on the website for pre-orders. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the, the big machine that is Craftworks Distilling obviously has got, you know, delivery vans going everywhere, every day, and, you know, yeah. an army of kids on bikes. No, just um, him getting around in his car. The international and export allocations will probably go out pretty soon, yeah, yeah, so, get, so get in quick. So our, our, I think, six bottles of the 158 <laughs> will um, arrive either tomorrow or Monday. Um, if anyone wants to buy any, they're on the website now. Have a look up for those details and the images. Um, if you want to grab any tonight, we will find some miniatures and stuff to throw in. It was a bit of a bonus um, to, to help maybe push some sales along and, and support Crafty a bit. But um, yeah, I think as someone, Daniel, posted on the Facebook, Blackgate and Craftworks are first on your list to get out to as soon as we can travel. Yes, highly encourage that sort of carry-on. Um, but yeah, um, we do have really, a little... Really good. I mean, yeah... I don't encourage you to come into the store at the moment, mm. but um, if if you do find yourself around this area, I do have a little bit left of some of these if you want to try and try and um, share share the love a little bit. Mm. Um, we're going long tonight, which I which I like. Um, yeah, you don't know where to be. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I've got to be at Rover soon. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> um, now. Joey, we haven't really let you talk about wine or grapes much tonight. I do quite a lot of that. And you're getting a little bit edgy. A bit, bit nervous? No, I like. I think. Should I? Just, I'll, I'll go. I'll go and get my wine. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> but more of a more of a concept than yeah. a wine tonight, I think. More of a concept. Okay, fair enough. Um, while we were doing the uh, peated whiskey tasting on uh, Tuesday, I think it was. Taste don't mean anything anymore in a global pandemic, but that's all right. Um, I was. We were talking a lot about soil and matters we we're just doing with peat, and I was sitting around this side and obviously Joe was sitting around that side listening and I could feel the fingernails get into the oak <laughs> countertop here just with fear and you know not being able to jump in and talk about soil true so it's very true um, yeah back to back to talking about grapes and you've put something out from the fridge there yeah yeah so obviously um, you did mention the uh, virtual tastings that we're doing Yes. Um, which they look they look a lot like this. They do look much. a lot like this, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, we were offered the or got, got our hands on the um, little fifty mil whiskey sample bottles, yep. which were perfect. Yeah. Which we could send out in little packs and, and get all that done. And um, see, we love a good wine event as much as we love a good whiskey event. Um, but trying to kind of I, just just kind of get get the logistics of it. All happening proper and still make it, you know, fun and, and accessible, and you know, without yeah. stripping hundreds of dollars out of people's pockets. Yeah, and actually, this is quite a good opportunity. Who would be open if we sent you six bottles of wine to open them all in one night? Yeah, that was the, the initial. Yeah, the initial 
very first thing that popped into the head was, well, let's just send everyone six bottles of wine and then we'll have six bottles of wine and we'll all just taste along. And then mm. the more we sort of thought about it, then, oh, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, the, the, the poor, you know, people who are locked down by themselves and couples by yeah. themselves <laughs> having to plough through three bottles of wine each. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, it's sort of back to the drawing board and then we sort of toyed with the idea of asking a few wineries to, to bottle us some smaller little samples and stuff like that. But I think for, you know small producers and stuff like that the idea of yes stop like changing your your bottling run or you know having it and, and wine it and wine reacts differently as well doesn't it it, it does like, yes you, yeah. you, you can bottle you can get a bottle of whiskey and bottle mm. it down into smaller size it's gonna you know 99.99 percent it's gonna live mm. through that transition but if, if we got a bottle of wine and put it into you know four other vessels yeah you got oxygen playing its part straight away yeah a lot um, quicker you don't know how it's going to behave and you know you wouldn't really feel comfortable about sending out wine like that and having it reach your customer wherever they be in australia in the same condition yeah so then back to the drawing board again after that and then uh yes yeah, so we've sort of been toying around with a few bits and pieces and uh, i think mid last week uh we sort of announced um uh working with the good folks at the bendham wine importing um who specialize in uh well a lot of things actually Champagne, uh, Riesling, Burgundy, Australian producers, and also... Um, after parties. After parties, lots of after parties. Um, and also sherry and fortified wines and Madeira and that kind of thing. And um, a lot of the stuff that we get from them comes in smaller size bottles, therefore making it a little bit more approachable price-wise. And um, also with a lot of these styles of wine, they do tend to hold up a little bit longer than traditional wines. So we thought, I, I adore you know fortified wines and, and sherries um both here in australia as we just got off what was essentially tokai appreciation about 10 minutes ago yeah um and then you know they look at some of the, the great fortifiers of, of spain and portugal uh which is just out, outstanding so we put together a little pack which i think normally is about 115 120 bucks or something here in store it's 99 bucks you get it delivered to your house for free um, and then on the 30th of April, we'll go live quite similar to this, probably with better angles. Um, yeah. And, and taste all three together. And they're, they're, they're 375 mil bottles of some, some exceptional um, Fino, Manthania and Pedro Jimenez expressions from some good, good houses over there. And uh, that has just gone, yeah, great. Gang glasses, really, really fun. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lots of people jumping on board for that, um, which I'm really looking forward to. So that being said, got a little bit too excited and just thought, well, why not let's do a sherry tonight? Um, not realizing that I'd probably have to talk about it and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try not to give away too much about what we're gonna what we're gonna be going through on the night. But tonight, uh, we've just got a really easygoing little um, non-vintage fino uh, from Torre Albala, the Electrico Fino de Lager. Um, ah, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty I excited. love fino sherry. So it's like. Um, I'll give you this. Oh, yeah, yeah. New glass, beautiful. Um, New balls, please, balls, boy. What it... Thank yeah, you. The re, like, it, it's weird that we sort of all went oh. straight to, um, went straight to sherry as, like, the first virtual wine thing, but I, like, I just, I love it. I, like, don't want to, like, you know, give away too many secrets and have the whole, whole of Australia start chasing our balls of sherry. I don't think that's going to happen somehow. Yeah. Um, but it's just so versatile. Yeah. Like, the, the different styles and... I should note that um, Toro Albala, this this sherry, uh, well, this this producer, I should say, um, it's not actually sherry. So they're not based in Jerez. That's right. Yeah, yes. they're actually up about 150 kilometers northeast in um, Montilla de Morales. Which that um, work, work on that accent. Which, before, yeah, before yeah, yeah. Be which is um, which is still uh, highly recognised for growing um, Pedro Jimenez grapes and producing wines in a, in a Fino style. So, you know, the, the short way about it is that, that Fino um, spends a time maturating in oak barrels under a, a layer of yeast known as a floor yeast, which is not usually native to specific regions in the world, um, that will cultivate on top of the wine as it's sitting in the barrel. What this does is it protects it from oxygen, um, but it still gives it a, a slightly, almost like a, an oxidative note so it's not necessarily porous, but oxygen is allowed in, but just in really, really tiny, tiny amounts. Yeah. Um, 
which is where you get that that really lovely sort of um, tartness on the nose there. Yeah. Um, Afinu is is typically the the driest expression. Um, moving through to Manzanilla, Oloroso, Manzanilla, Amontillado, uh, Palo Cortado, Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez. Yep. Mos, Moscatel. I've, I've seen a couple of questions come in here, <laughs> um, and Paradise Wine Show say send it, lads. We definitely will. <laughs> we'll try our um, best. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in, yep. in, a, in a second because I think there's some things we want to go over. But um, Lewis from uh, Wild Rover says, G'day, Scotty. And yes, Lewis, we'll be dancing out the front of the Rover after this is finished to try and see if magically <laughs> the doors open. Um, Emma Towers, can I watch this tomorrow? Uh, yes, if you feel, if you're that much of a sucker for punishment, uh, yes, you can. Yeah. Watch our ugly mugs back on, the, um, back on the Facebook. It'll be served yeah. there. But um, we're seeing a couple of questions mm-hmm. about Sherry in general come through. So, like, row back a little bit. Like, sherry comes from a certain region in Spain. It's mm-hmm. a fortified wine. What's a fortified wine? So, no. No. The term sherry is, is protected, um, and it has to come from a region designated in the uh, southwest of Spain called Jerez. Um, and that is that, that has that term, hence why you might have seen the word sherry printed on a lot of bottles of Australian fortified wine in the early 1900s um, and that has since been um, you know take, taken taken away so now we see terms like sherry style or musket or apera um, things like that to, to uh, recognize Australian fortified wine um, sherry doesn't have to be fortified now is, is PX actually sherry so PX uh, or Pedro Jimenez is a grape that is uh, used in sherry production, uh, most famously probably known for PX um, sherries, which are like really nutty, um, picked very late um, and often dried out as well to try and um, to try and uh, concentrate the sugar in the grapes. Same way we would do with yeah. musket here yeah. in Australia. And then once you, the the grapes are dried out, you have a higher percentage of sugar. So you press them, you'll get a, a higher sugar. Um, juice and from there you can add alcohol to fortify it back up to the strength you want it at so around 15 to, to 17 um all px is sherry not all sherry is px uh y- yes and no you can make um pedro jimenez outside of hereth um what we're at so, <laughs> so <laughs> okay. this, this is yeah. a this is a rabbit hole yeah and it, it, we, we, it's 100 percent a rabbit hole dedicating so, an hour and a half to this in a couple yeah. of weeks to to go through it so when um so yeah, Pedro Jimenez is a, is a vine. The grapes that grow. We grow Pedro Jimenez here in Australia, um, but we can't label it as sherry, hence we're not being in Jerez. Um, the wine we're drinking right now is a Fino style. Now, if we were in Jerez making Fino sherry, we'd be using predominantly we'd be using a grape called Palomino. Um, Palomino in Jerez, which is quite coastal, um, lends itself very well to this sort of style. We're, we're 150 kilometers away from Jerez now, up in Montilla Morales. Uh, so this fino is actually made from Pedro Jimenez. Yeah. So Toro okay. Albala is a is a, um, a a wine producer, and they only work with Pedro Jimenez. So they make both dry and sweet PX. <laughs> so, this is why we're dedicating an hour and a half. I love I love sherry, but let's kind of say it out loud, and you go, okay, this is confusing as hell. Yeah. Um, I, I guess like, you know, from. And I know there's a few people who tuned in for the, the crafty, you know, whiskey and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff, whose first introduction to sherry has come either through like the really cheap, awful stuff that grandma drinks, mm-hmm. yep. and then in terms of whiskey. Yeah. And so, you know, whiskey's this complicated thing and barrels are one part and sherry's mm-hmm. one part of it. Sherry is just as complicated and in depth as yep. whiskey and there's so many different types and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so absolutely, that's why, I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, uh, I, I really like sherry and I'm lucky enough to kind of see a bit of it come through the store and, and taste a lot of it. And I drink a lot of it at home. Um, but also, it's one of those things where you are like, you know, you look at it, like you might, like it might be the same for someone that's not necessarily into whiskey. You look at a wall of whiskey and just go, what the hell do all these words mean? Um, which is why we're really excited to put the sherry tasting together. We're only going, we're only really even going to touch the surface in that two hour long tasting yeah yeah. it was was an hour and a half three minutes ago it's gonna be it's gonna be close to two hours i reckon um but 
what like what I like this is just so drinkable so yeah I've, ah, yeah I've got delicious. a lot of comments about this um, a bit of chat going on on the Facebook mm -hmm. poor Emma Towers has actually cast us to her TV screen which I really feel sorry for your TV there <laughs> we, we are far better looking um, in low resolution than in high definition or real life so yeah. I, I cut that down a bit we should just do radio um, Emma Towers uh, housemate says how should I best drink Amarula uh, that, that's, that's the South African liqueur yeah, yeah, thing yeah it's like a creamy type thing I yeah, think. yeah quickly quickly is yeah. my Oh, uh, mix it with like Bailey's and Kahlua and stuff like that. Or drink it over ice or I don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, however you want. There's there's a few other comments going on there, and I think we're descending into uh, madness. <laughs> but uh, we might ignore that one. Um, and a bit of chat between Peter Bigno and Crafty. That um, this is good. When people talk to each other on our live streams, I can just eavesdrop. Oh, wait, I know the answer to that one. Yeah, is it? It's Broad, probably it's probably not a broadcastable. Yeah. Okay, no, we'll, I, but I do. Yeah, you will, we'll private message. I haven't even read the question yet. Um, <laughs> Might get this sometimes also. Um, a couple of questions here. Sorry to go back to whiskey, but is Sherry PX and all the rest of the same style, but are different grapes and picked at different times in regions? Am I wrong? So, all, all, so Oloroso PX, um, uh, same style, but different grapes, different times, different regions. It's all of the above, isn't it? So Oloroso the, the, the and PX? Of difference between Oloroso and PX is a different grapes different regions different times picking all that sort of thing yeah so um yeah so so oloroso is yes, predominantly is a style pedro Jimenez is a style but it's also a grape yeah so you can make oloroso from px yeah so you can make px from px yeah obviously we'll, we'll tighten this up and i won't ask so many dumb questions by the time the sherry yeah no so it. yeah absolutely so yeah oloroso um doesn't see any floor um it does see a lot of ox oxygen um, and it's made in a drier style. You can sweeten it up if you want to by adding parts of uh, Pedro Jimenez to it. Uh, but I suppose what we all know PX to be is, is sweet, sort of fortified, a honey sort of nectar yeah. um, in style. But that's not, uh, that's not all that sherry is, which I think is, I was saying to you when, before we started was, like, I really, like, and when we were talking about what we're drinking at home and stuff like that, it's just pulling things out of the counter that we wouldn't normally go to, which might be a dry sherry, it might be a fortified wine, might be a, a grappa or something like yeah. that, you know? Like, yeah. And actually we might, that's probably a good question to throw to the crowd as um, if I could have a little bit more, please. Which <laughs> I'm actually gonna talk about this sherry <laughs> in a second. I didn't think expect this to be I, so confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna throw a so question. This is Fino yeah. sherry made from the Pedro Jimenez grape. Yeah, okay. Not in, this is Fino wine made from the Pedro Jimenez grape near the sherry region. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah we, we've thrown a lot of information <laughs> in a very non-linear sort of way because it's of how questions come from everyone. It's this all over the place. But a um, quick question I want to throw out there, and I want to talk about this while people are thinking, is you know, what, what you were saying just then, drinks that potentially you've bought over the years mm. or been gifted to you that you don't reach for because you're a little bit you know, considered to be out there and that sort of thing, talking about things like liqueurs, yep. What you were saying earlier today, grappers, absinthe, is, yeah, the piscos, the peach schnapps, or yeah, the, whatever the peach schnapps you yeah. like. Has anyone been looking deep into the cupboard and finding things in this past, you know, mm. four weeks that has come to the fore? Um, and you know, we gonna need to take as many silver linings out of this as uh, we we can. Um, you know, what what are those things coming to the fore? Um, so you know, have have a think about that. Throw some questions in. But can I just say on the record, I bloody love Fino Sherry. It's so good. Um, not always a huge fan of Fino Sherry Casks mm. maturing whiskey. It can mm. go either way. But just that, and just like mm. I lost my shit over that jury you pulled out about mm -hmm. five or six yeah. episodes ago, just that nuttiness, that yeah. that alluring. It's it's not a it's not a sweetness. It's just that really and and like it's weird to talk about intoxicating as a um, term when you're talking about alcoholic drinks. Like just that really just drags you in that nuttiness, and you could just I mean it's fifteen yeah. percent, so it's very very drinkable. Um, yeah. And one, one thing I will add, especially with this producer, Tor Albala, which we have a lot of their, their fortified, well, their, their um, sherry-like expressions here in store. Um, if you were to go to the region of Hereth and sort of track down in your, your everyday Fino sherry, um, it needs to be aged for um, two years to be considered Fino sherry in Hereth. Um, that's, under a, that's under a floor yeast blanket, which that's another science lesson for another day. Um, and then, yeah, you normally, like you would, I guess, 
if you were trying to get whiskey out pretty quickly or, so, or something like that, more for a, a financial gain than anything else, um, anywhere in the world, you you pull it out and then you bottle it and you put Fino Sherry on the label, blah, blah, blah. But Sherry, um, well, Sherry Production uh, operates on that Solera system. So we know we know Solera, I guess, from, from, from whiskey as well, um, which is... Basically, if you're taking um, liquid out of the barrel, you're then topping it up with a liquid from another barrel, which is very common practice um, in in this region. But uh, when you're doing that, so over the, over the course of a couple of years, and you want to just make your, you know, you run of the mill sort of fino, bang, and you go off you go, two years old, fino on the shelf, there you are. This bottle, I think, retails at about 20 Eight dollars here in Australia, twenty nine dollars. That's bang on. It's ten, it's at least ten years old. Oof. Yeah. So the, the 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 juice in here is at least ten years old out of a Solera system. So there's nothing younger that's been aged that long. All under floor. Um, out, like out, like so good, ridiculously good. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the top Fino producers for this area. Um, yeah, is this, are we doing this one on the tasting? No, so we're not. But we are going to be doing another Fino from Jerez, from a producer called Equipa Navazos, along with their Manthania okay. as well. Um, which, yeah, Manthania is basically Fino, but from a specific area. Okay. From San Luca de Barra, uh, de Barra Mata, sorry. Um, and then we're going to finish on uh, one of Tora Albala's Pedro Yemez Expressions, which you are notorious for finishing whiskey tastings with this. Ah, yes. And it's all I get asked for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, we went, went through a phase. Remember when we could do like tastings with people in the same room? That, yeah. was, that was a bit of fun back in the, back in the good old days. Um, but yeah, we went through a phase of, okay, we would, you know, finish off with another whiskey. And we sort of thought, no, let's, let's change it up a bit. So we did like liqueurs. And then it was actually, it was the, that North Star PX that we were talking about. Yeah. We did a surprise once at a North Star mm -hmm. tasting. People loved it. And I was like, okay, we've got to do this all the time. And I think yeah. we sell more bottles of sherry at whiskey tastings when we do yeah. that than bottles of whiskey, yeah. which is um, which is but pretty cool. Yeah, but it's so good. So I, like, I always liked it. Like, obviously having a you know a, a, a bit of a restaurant background before this. Like, sherry is or wines of this style are uh, here's now some of the best food matchings of all time. Yeah, like you think about like that coast, all that that cured meats or that salty fish or even that like when you get into oloroso you think like mushrooms and like that really baked kind of savory element you know those like hard cheeses where you get that like like crystallization mm -hmm. and minerals coming through yeah comte or something like yeah. that which is oh, like comte and jura is a pretty classic pattern this is just jura we, we, on we steroids we make a bit of it here as well i think yeah um, in certain places um yeah so so i just i got really excited about the sherry tasting we put online last week so i thought we'd open a bottle of sherry um, or bottle of fino, and yeah, so saying on the back here, aged cheeses, Iberico ham, and hard red meats. Um, yeah, yeah, I can get behind that. But, um, a really good um, answer to the question that you have there, Love PX from Will on the Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, Love PX goes well with ice cream, the ultimate ISO aperitif. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, drizzle that's, some PX on your ice cream. That's the right. sort of, you yeah. know, experimentation we want to see. Um, and a quick g'day to Ryan Hartshorn, who, um, from the uh, Hartshorn Distillery down in Tassie. Uh, so, g'day, I don't know if you're still here, but um, so, g'day, a little while back, um, doing hand sanitizer. Um, I know Matt Bailey on the Society Streams been yeah. uh, drinking a bit of hand sanitizer. Not really, don't drink hand sanitizer. I uh, did, um, I did like your comment, well, I did like notice your comment there about not particularly enjoying Fino cask aged whiskies. Yeah. Um, and you think that's, you almost see it notable with, when you look at, you know, a fortified cast that you do enjoy, which might be PX or, or a para or anything like that, to be higher sugar variety wines, whereas this is quite a dry wine. Do you think that drier wines, like, have an unpleasant effect on barrels to be reused? No, not not necessarily. Um, it's a case by case basis, and mm. you know, like I, I said, Fina can go either way. There was a 1966 Glen Farkless mm. Fina, which was unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, Fino can be quite expensive mm. and they don't make as much of it as you see all the Rosso and that sort of thing. Mm. So it's a bit of a, like a, a smaller test field to, um, it's very delicate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and also it's probably, yeah, it's not giving as much back. Mm. Um, 
So to use a Fino Sherry cask, you need to use it for a long time. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Mm. That sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, a question from, from Emma, um, our best mate Emma, and her Emma's neighbour, uh, Emma's neighbour Adam. Have I tried uh, Adam's chili wine? Uh, no, I haven't tried your chili wine, mate. Well, I've tried chili. I think chili wine in general. I've tried ice wine. That is like chill, chili with a Y. Um, <laughs> but here all week. Um, okay. But also, what is your favourite grape in the world? Um, I'm going to go first and split it between two grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Because they have it on very good authority. That's what they drink in heaven. Yeah, right. Yeah, when you go to heaven, yeah. the bar in heaven, and they say, what do you want, red or white? Oh, you know, I have a white tonight. It's Chardonnay. We say, oh, I feel mm -hmm. like a red. It's Pinot Noir. Um, very good authority. Spec to, spec to Jesus, just over Easter there. Um, that's also wrong. <laughs> um, and everyone's favourite grape should always and will always be Riesling. Riesling? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dry or sweet? Both. Okay. Yeah. When are we going to do that um, Mosul night? Uh, I don't know, hopefully soon, actually. Maybe we yeah. could do like a, a Mosul, ta uh, Mosul virtual tasting. Because I'd love to, like, just like just like someone like Cher, like, um, we see a lot of people that come through the store or, or you know, have chats and stuff like that, that Riesling's always sweet. That, that mindset of Riesling always being sweet. And I think if you were to get an excellent dry German Riesling, an excellent off dry German or Alsatian Riesling, and maybe like a like a good sort of Auslese or, or late harvest Riesling as well. Like that would be a really cool lineup to do side by side. Mm. Probably get them in 375 ml bottles as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Emma does point out that Champagne, which obviously is Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. Chardonnay and Pinot Meunier as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So maybe they're drinking Champagne in heaven as well. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Some of the best champagnes are 100% Pinot Meunier. <laughs> or Blanc de Vent. Yeah. Yeah. I, get, I, I feel like heaven would be a bit of a party. Heaven like, would be a great party. If you yeah. spent you know, your life mm. doing everything you can to get into heaven, <laughs> it's time to let loose, right? Yeah. Like, if you're in hell, it's mm. sort of like, ah, oh, yeah, Scotty, you had your fun. Now yeah. you do, do, some, do some real work. But I think it's, it's the opposite for, um, mm. for heaven. Yes, Craft Field, the alarm is going off. I'll go and turn that off. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I just think we, I just think we should all be drinking more, more fortifieds from Australia and beyond, um, and and aged. And I, we we actually are seeing a lot of Australian winemakers experimenting with uh, dry, floor aged wines. Um, some guys down the Yarra doing doing Chardonnay in a very Jura esque style, which is very cool. I you just remind me I was about to read out a comment from Peter Bignall, who was our special mm. guest on the Whiskey Roundtable um, earlier. Uh, sorry yesterday all the days you know blend into each other these days but i sometimes let a floor type of yeast grow over the top of some of my whiskey ferments right okay um, yeah right which is fascinating and doesn't surprise me from peter bignall yeah. at all because you know we'll try anything once um we'll need to i don't know what the results were there we need to talk mm. about um that sure thing. Just, see what the just effects apply would like a, a barrier from oxygen yeah what does that mean in real terms in terms of you know the brew yeah. that then becomes yeah. whiskey probably potentially not a lot but mm. um particularly in the in the brew you'd think it would um you know make some differences yeah yeah absolutely um yeah like this one a lot yeah I mean, um, for, for 30 bucks and xeno comments here scott you are entirely correct um it is chardonnay and pinot noir <laughs> i think that's I think there's some of the letters are mixed up in what he said, but I'm pretty sure I'm reading that correctly. Right. Yeah. Um, do a blog of the best uh, chain store ventures, please, for all the uh, hospo hustlers sitting at home. Um, we don't know what that means. Let's be honest. I don't know what you're A blog about. of the best chain store ventures. Is that just us going to chain stores? I have no idea. No. I don't know what you mean by that, Emma. Um, no one wants to see that. No. Yeah. Come to us, we'll sort you out. <laughs> just, come here. Don't know what I do. um, we're not, we're not going to leave these two stalls for at least four days. Semyon, best grape. Actually, yeah, that could be argued. Uh, yeah, yeah Semyon's pretty good. Semyon is pretty good. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, let's dedicate a night to the best grape. We can run a poll. We can have votes. People need things to bet on right now because, you know, we can, we can run, a, run a bookies on it. On the best, on the best grape? The, the best grape, yeah. <laughs> Um, awesome. Um, again, I would say come down here and if you swing by the Oak Barrel in the next you know, week or so, try a bit of this mm. this wine. 
So don't. This would hold up. Actually. It would, but don't it's stay not going stay to. at home. We're going to finish it tonight, mm. so just to make sure you can order it online. Yeah. Smoke barrel, best chain store. The store I'd be yeah. chained to. The store I'd be chained to. Well, it's sort of you, you know. You start it, like a chain section where you sell chains. It did happen to me. I worked just up the road and started coming here mm. most most nights a week, and then all of a sudden they said, "Mate, if you're going to come here this often, just take take <laughs> a job," um, which which happens sometimes. But, um, but I, like. There are a lot of, I suppose, chain stores around the country that I've sort of noticed that. I mean, uh, a lot of my uh, people that I know in the hospitality industry have, have found work in yep. in the, these times of how busy they're being. So, um, yeah, I think we, we do need them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. Mm. Um, but, but also, I think it's a, if we're going to take some, uh, you know, silver linings out of the current situation it is we're, we're in, this is an unbelievably good opportunity to not only get to know your, your local independent bottle stores, but get to know your producers. Mm. Um, we're getting involved with a an excellent little uh, campaign out of Victoria called Delivered Live, which is based on the, the music industry. Um, and obviously the music industry is so built around, you know, a live economy these days. Done. In one fell swoop, pretty much wiped out every musician's in, in the country's uh, you know, income stream gone. So every Sunday, Delivered Live works with uh, local Victorian musicians, does a bit of a live festival um, that's that's live stream. And they're starting to work with producers as well. Um, so I actually had a really good chat this morning with um, Philadelphia Wines, which will be streamed on mm. Sunday, I think once they, you know, edit me down and make me look good. Yeah. Um, talking about the, the high country, which is where some of my favorite wines come from. Um, it was, it was actually quite a, a good interview going back and forth making a lot of sense and yeah we can do that and we can do this and I was like great so how many more you know cases of Sorenberg Gamay can you get me and they just laughed in my face so <laughs> uh, my favourite Australian wine uh, year in year out Sorenberg Gamay Sorenberg Gamay yeah was going to be there right about now actually the plan was Bathurst on Easter <laughs> head down to um, you know via Corowa then do Yakandanda mm. um, Beechworth all that sort of thing up to you know Kerrang Murrabit this week was where I was going to be, but I'm not. I'm still here. Um, but yeah, so uh, these after hours normally go for an hour. We are now into well over an hour and a half. Um, but the, but the, the, the crowd interaction. The crowd is it's good. It's been you know, outstanding. Mum and Dad are still listening, so I better, better keep going. A yeah. um, <laughs> couple of things. Uh, Crafty, it's a creative field. Uh, creative time and so many fronts despite the shit sandwich we had been served and didn't order it. We definitely didn't order it. You no. Water, uh, waiter, can I have a refund on your 2020? 100%. Um, what is your favourite apocalypse liqueur? You can only have one. Liqueur. Apocalypse liqueur? Uh, yeah, orange cello from Baker Williams. Um, I'm going to count Amaro Montenegro as a liqueur. Okay. Yeah. Done. Uh, yeah, so my one's from, uh, my better Mudgy. Mm. Obviously, lemon cello is a big thing. They make an orange cello mm. with uh, local fruit, and just great. It was like thick and syrupy yeah. over ice. Awesome. Um, so, have I never had chili wine? I don't think I have. I've had chili mead. I've had we chili had a, beer. A chili uh, umeshu the other day. Chili umeshu. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had a chili wine. And to be honest, Adam, I don't think I want to. I love chili. No. I was I was having quite an interesting conversation the other day with a, a local producer of ours that was saying that. Um, wine Australia won't allow you to call certain things wine with um, they've got like a, a list of certain additives that you can put in wine and still be classified wine and things outside of that um, like whether it be you know natural uh, resins or anything like that they actually that actually um, jeopardizes your chance to be able to label your product wine so it could, yeah, it okay. could be like wine based beverage or something like that i think that's yeah. how they get away with like wine coolers and stuff um yeah okay. yeah interesting um but yeah but yeah, yeah and I, I i do agree um with, with whiskeyography on the um instagram there that the more the more other people drink the better we do look yeah. so that's always a good idea um did you get a, a sorry back to sherry comment which i would love to sit here and talk about sherry all night um yeah but uh, yeah yeah um I think we both uh, quite enjoyed this. Oh, it's, it's it's awesome, and it's just it's right up my alley in terms of mm. like I can I love Oloroso and Pierre mm. Sherry, but I like them in moderation. Yeah, they're digestives mm. after dinner, 
not necessarily over ice for me because I like that texture and that thickness not to be broken down. This I can I could finish this bottle. Yeah, I think it's By it's myself. like Fino and, and especially Manthania as well. Um, they're wines that are made to be consumed, and in these parts of Spain, that's exactly how they're done. Yeah. So you don't have a glass of Sauvignon Blanc when you start your meal; you have a glass of Fino. Yeah. Um, and just like just like Riesling and, and it being sweet, for whatever reason here in Australia, we kind of get this concept of like, well, I only drink sherry in very certain occasions, or they drink Fino in very certain occasions, whereas like, I mean, it's almost every, well, it was almost every second weekend I was down at the fish market smashing back oysters and, and sashimi yeah. and everything else, and like, I was taking down, you know, Muscadet and Riesling, but I really should have been taking sherry. Why, uh, Fino. Why, why do you think it is? You know, because it's, it's 15%, it's, mm. it's perfectly palatable, you could, you know, share this between mm. two people and, you know, not fall off a cliff. Why do you think it is that sherry has that special occasion mentality? Well, it's because, like, as we just proved, is that the two of us here that are somewhat knowledgeable on booze can try and explain a $30 bottle and still get confused. Yeah, okay. So, so it's, it's, it's a lack of knowledge. I, I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's lack of knowledge at all. I think that the Australian wine knowledge is there. I just think that it's a lack of communication in the sense that, like, what, what, what is this? And then, you know, like, it might take, you know, like, I don't know if, if, if every person at every conventional bottle store in the country is going to be able to break down Fino Sherry for you in, you know, 25 words or less. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, which is, you know, why, why we love doing these sorts of events that we held here and then events. Like, every Sherry event we've done here in the last 24 months has been absolutely outstanding. Um, and I think this, this virtual one will be as well. But yeah, but I think people just need to drink it. Or I just think that, you know, I think as a as a beverage commuting con uh, beverage consuming country, we like a certain degree of certainty in our like in our wines that we pick. We need things to say Shiraz on the label. Yeah. We need things to say Grenache on the label or something along. Whereas it's kind of a, something a little bit more unknown that we kind of come to like oh uh, I don't know about that, and we're guilty of it as well. But the, the the fortified wine section is always in this really strange part of the store, yeah. where you kind of need to walk in and ask where it is. Yeah, it's never like, it's never like you've got you know, your it's Jura just, whites the, and you don't have your your dry sherry next to it. There's no floor stack of sherry. There's no floor stack of sherry, and yeah, you kind of need to go up to the 17 year old kid, 18 year old kid behind the counter and go, "Where's your uh, dry sherry?" And it's normally, uh, what's that really? Jackie, yeah, yeah. And, but um, but we see it here as well when people ask for sherry, and you, you know, okay, here it is, and then they go, oh, that's not what I meant, you know, because yeah, you know, sherry's yeah. up to you know well over a hundred dollars, yeah. you know, and that sort of thing, you know, from basically about thirty bucks mm. up to you know 200, 250 um, and they go, oh, now where's the where's the five dollar stuff? And yeah, I mean, yeah, that like, or I just I will chuck some in my cooking. Yeah, hundred yeah. um, percent. Yeah, but absolutely, yeah. Whiskey or if you says lack of context and application. Definitely, the Australian palate doesn't have to do with Fino Sherry. Um, we don't, but we make so many, like some of the best, you know, restaurants and stuff develop all these dishes in this country that would just like beg for for Sherry to go alongside it. Um, you know, you could do a you could do a whole menu based off from your appetizer, like right down to to your dessert, with only um, Sherry and fortified pairings, and it it'd be some of the best. Um, but yeah, I just I don't, doesn't don't think it gets the love that it probably should. Um, but I mean, if it keeps the prices down and the accessibility easy for people like you and me, then yeah, it's great. Yeah. I, I think that's a very good point. Is um, this was a really good opportunity to jump on the horse before it bolts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. And and then not not to be sort of discluded is the amount of stuff that does come out that is very cheap and is mass produced um, and is to be you know uh, looked past I guess if you're looking for for quality yeah. more than anything and I think that can get a little cloudy as well a um, couple of questions here uh, or a, a comment first from Will on the, on the Facebook um, who I've got a feeling Will knows a little bit about this topic so it's mm. always good to have that um, it's like the dirty little secret of the Australian wine industry and I guess we remember our grandparents having a tipple and, and it yeah. is and you know Again, to bring it back to, to whiskey, and I, I don't always want to do that, but whiskey had the exact same thing. In the 80s, yeah. whiskey was granddad's mm. drink, and it, it you know it took a good sort of 15 years for whiskey to really become cool, and all these things 
are quite cyclical and so I think you know rum for a different reason but I think sherry definitely fits a very similar mould it's this old people's drink as whiskey was yeah. for a little while um, which is just like before we go through that I, um, one of the things that did just like reignite my, my love for these sorts of wines was earlier this year or maybe actually late last year it might have been around November I can't remember what it was but the Bendham the, the importing company for this actually had its 15th birthday party down at the Four Seasons and um so what they what they did was they they hired out this sort of big event uh, big event space, set up a bunch of tables with like all their they had all their Australian winemakers there, um, every, all like a bunch of import tables. There was some incredible German Rieslings on pour. There was some great Burgundy on pour, um, and they had so many tables they needed a bit of help. So I got the call up and said, "Do you can come down and help pour wine for you know four hours or whatever it was that day?" And I was like, "Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll come down for sure." You know, we'll swing a case of wine in, in return. And I thought, great. So I got there, and they said, all right, you, you're going to do the, the, the sherry and fortifieds table. And like, is that all right? And I thought, oh, I can kind of scrape through if I have to. Um, but sure. And so it was, it was essentially a day full of, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of Sydney wine professionals and, and um, yeah, people that were very involved with the, the Sydney wine, Australian wine scene, and people that really loved it. And initially being a bit intimidated, so I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sherry table, it's pouring like this, and some of their top tier, sort of $100, $150, $200 stuff. And the whole, like, the whole four hours was spent of the, some of the top uh, palettes and sommeliers and stuff like that going, can I get some more of that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole day, it's kind of like, just, can I just get a little bit more? Like, sommeliers would lap it up. Yeah, it's unbelievable, and like I think that is it's that dirty little secret of being like, just don't tell anyone, just it's a bit more of that. It's, it's like the floodgates are, are starting to to bend, and when it goes boom, everyone's yeah. going to turn and be like, shit, do you, I didn't know you like sherry. Yeah, I thought I was the only one like yeah, sherry, yeah, yeah, and just yeah. like it's just going to be this whole thing that works around. Uh, that's that's all it was, and yeah, it's because if you're, it, it's one of those things as well. It's it's kind of like, it's that palate refresher. A little bit, especially something like this, yeah. which is just gives that tart. It's, it's got that acid. It's got that lovely sort of minerality feel towards it. Admittedly, it is eight years older than most of the other fiends we see on the market, but complexity, nuttiness, but approachability at the same time. Yeah. Um, couple, a couple of questions, quick, and uh, Emma, I will get to all your questions in one hit at the end, I reckon. Um, but Reese Starkey, sorry, I did see your question has taken a little while for me to get to it. Should you swirl your glass? Um, you know with wine mm. and should you do it quickly or should you do it slowly does it matter uh, uh, no no okay um, it, it, if Been anything a it's, it's, fallacy, it's maybe like a little bit of muscle memory that's kind of built in yeah. but um, with with bigger wines and, and maybe with wines that are a little bit more intricate like like things like Fino Sherry and stuff like that and with like spirits as well if something like you it might take a little bit of bit of nosing but you can always sometimes kind of feel like there's something hiding a yeah. little bit, especially in bigger high ABV wines that need a little bit of air. Um, I like to do it with this sherry and, and things like this that have, you know, those, those layers and that, that sort of complexity, just because just to see if anything's changing yeah. when you're coming back I've, to it. I've definitely but found... To enjoy wine, no. Yeah. You don't to I've definitely found with um, spirits, and particularly high ABV whiskies mm -hmm. and rums and stuff, and you're right, you do it and you... You sit there on the table, yeah. almost for something to do while you're yeah. thinking about it, and you actually get like you just blow up ethanol. Yeah. Um, and so you go, oh, shit. Okay. And so I've actually had to train myself to not yeah. do that. But it's also like, you know, I'll, I'll see a lot of wines out of um, a Coravin, which is like um, a uh, needle based system in which you can take, like, you can pour wine out of a bottle without actually allowing any oxygen in. And especially like wines with a bit of age or anything like that, they just need that air to get them going to mm. get. You know those flavors coming out or anything like that um but yeah sitting at home i think like now i, I just kind of do it just purely out of like yeah that's that's what yeah. happens um yeah but uh yeah well i think whatever whatever works and if decanting is always good for, for wines of age or wines you think might be a little bit closed and um it's always good to get a bit of air going through it and see what happens yeah yeah, yeah. so um yeah round about doesn't doesn't really matter, and honestly, do, do whatever you feel. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you I'm, look very cool in front of your friends. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit the same. I need something to do with my hands sometimes. Yeah, um, 
you know, yeah. I think that's maybe why I hold pens all the time. <laughs> I, just, I have nothing to write on. I just need, I just hold yeah. pens for the for the sake of it. Um, a big thank you to uh, David for tuning in. He's going off to watch some TV. Uh, that makes sense. Um, uh, can you please show me the label again of the sherry or the link to get it on the oak barrel? Now yep. I'm going to take a, a. So this is it. So the producer is a um, a, a house called Toro Albala. Um, and this wine uh, falls under their Electrico range. So the the house that they actually age their sherries in is an old uh, electrical factory, a power facility for that town. Um, and they, their winemaker discovered that this particular building was exceptionally good for aging sherry because you need a constant temperature throughout summers and winters with these things going through uh, like centuries of vintages. Um, and this is the Fino del Lager as non-vintage. So yeah, it's been aged in that Solera um, for 10 years minimum. Um, yeah. I've just posted the link on the uh, Facebook as well. Oh, um, yeah, it might be. I, t I, took, a, I took a leap of faith saying yeah. that yes, this whiskey or this uh, sherry is going to be on uh, the website and it's going it to be is, updated. Yeah. And it is, and it's got an image and everything. Topped up yesterday. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, look, obviously we, we've skirted around the edges and we've sort of been reacting to questions as they come in for the for the sherry, um, which which means we've sort of like missed the base knowledge a little bit. Um, yeah, which will be covered in uh, when we do that tasting. It will be covered, and like you, like you don't even have to buy the sherries to tune in. It'll be on Facebook and stuff as well. Yep. But that's where we're gonna we're gonna properly dedicate an hour and a half, two hours, just to. I will do my absolute best. To, to yeah, try yeah, and yeah. make it as, as un understanding as so possible. I, I still don't completely understand, so I might be trying to get G'day, Manly. We, um, uh, Manly Spirits, we said yeah, a little bit, Manly. gave you a bit of a plug earlier tonight to keep up the good work with the, with the gins. And, and uh, very well done on getting Reggie along. With your if he just mentioned, if only there was a place where the staff had a passion for a quality product and did tasting and could introduce the public to great local and international wine and whiskeys, beer and liquor. Mate, we can all dream. Yeah. Um, and if, if you find it, let me know because I've got a resume. I've got a lot yeah. of <laughs> um, really uh, interesting point here from Peter on the mm -hmm. glass swelling thing. Um, he swells his glass to, to coat the glass and hide the nose of the fresh glass. Which is, I mean, because okay. sometimes glasses can have um, aromas. I've mm. been in, I've spoken on conferences mm. um, and, and like panels before where, you know, they've, they've bought in glassware for something so that, you know, 500 people can have a taste mm. and you get cardboard box. Yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah. You know, from because mm. it's been sitting in cardboard and that's why we keep everything here for the tastings on racks and, mm. you know, air dry and that sort of stuff. But it is a very good point. And yes, Peter, I 100% agree. That's a really good way to, you know, there, sometimes glass does have a smell, um, you know, whether you know be cardboard or you know, you know remnants of the detergent mm. or if mm. it's just come out that sort of real hot smell. Yeah, yeah, you get that and musky so, sort yeah. of thing. So yeah, and one hundred percent, that's that's something I hadn't actually thought of, but I know that I do subconsciously. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well. Like with I think, I know sherry tastings we've done in the past, and also um, champagne tastings we've done in the past. One of the biggest comments for people that like it might be like we might be just doing an introductory thing and getting people along to come and try a bunch of stuff but one of the biggest comments we get is we do all of our wine based tastings in glasses that look just like this um and i got a comment the other day with the with the sherry one was oh you're gonna have the the sherry glasses the little snifter things and i was like well no i, I wouldn't personally drink i wouldn't personally taste quality sherry out of those because it really closes the nose up yeah as does a champagne flute so where we do all our champagne tastings we taste in glasses just like this as well because for for wines of this nature you need as much breathability as you can yeah. to bring them in that's where that oxygen comes into play as well and i mean like you know tim tim duckett from hartwood mm -hmm. um he i think he gets a little bit angry sometimes when we do our tastings with yeah with these glasses and because he would much prefer his whiskey be drunk in these glasses yeah. But when he brings down eight different drams, and we've got thirty <laughs> yeah. people, there, I don't have that many of these glasses yeah. to um, to play with. So it's quite interesting. And I've, you know, you joke about it, you know, drinking whiskey out of a mug or you mm -hmm. know this sort of thing. But I, you know, if I'm at home, I will, particularly if it's a gin and tonic or something. Mm -hmm. And my gin and tonics are very lean, so they are, you know, one to one mm -hmm. and not very big. It's because I want to taste the gin. I'm I'm a mm -hmm. lover of spirits. I want to taste that. But I always go for the wine glass rather than yeah, the tumbler yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, that's just, just me, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. And um, I know, like, these glasses, 
uh, do everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah red, red with, yeah. wine, sherry, um, you know, champagne. Uh, I know we, we've sold yeah. a lot of them to, to people who do a similar thing. Um, and the great thing is, you don't need to. It you know, like saves so much space at home. We're having yeah, yeah. two red wine yeah. glasses, two white wine glasses, two yeah. champagne glasses, two sherry glasses. Just got twenty of these. Yeah. So I think that's, that's what I really like. I love drinking wine like this out of a glass like this, just yeah. because you're getting nose and flavor at the same time. It's just it's really adding to it. Yeah. And it, like these are Chef and Sommelier is mm. the brand of these glasses. Mm. It doesn't need to be this particular mm. brand. That's the brand that we sell. But anything with this generic shape, with just a bit of that same sort of concave leaning in, yeah, yeah. concentrating flavors, but giving enough breadth at the bottom to, um, uh, you know, mm. to allow some, like, just like the Denver and Lily glasses yep. um, for, for whiskey. Yeah, same. Really in fact, they're the, almost exactly the same width yeah. um, and size. We one, of the, one of the sort of wine critics and writers that I sort of have the most respect for, Jancis Robinson, released a, a Ranger glassware last year. And it was um, exactly that. It was just one glass for all the wine she drinks. Oh, that I'm, like, really cool. I'm a big fan of that mentality. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Regardless of yeah. cost or like scientific thing, just having yeah. one one glass. Yeah, just have one glass. For me, you know, and I'm a, I'm a simple person, but the thing that's in the glass is more mm. important than the glass. Yeah. Same with the bottle. And I can't like bottle. You, yeah. I don't think really you come out and say that like I'm not gonna say that things don't taste better in certain glasses, but I think if you control that one variable, you can come to a come yeah. to a more accurate you know, opinion on things you're drinking. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Mainly spirits. A couple of comments. Uh, these glasses. Uh, oh, so those glasses are best, um, both functional and stylish. Yeah, I do agree. They look quite cool as well. Yeah. I'm um, a bit of chat. They're robust about... too. Yeah. I don't know how many of these were broken, but it's not many. Oh, I've broken a couple. Well, over five <laughs> years. Yeah. yeah. I've broken a couple. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, also just a quick note there. They're very excited about their you know potential upcoming whiskey, mm. and now that Reggie Paps is on board there, and he's. Um, I think Reggie Pax might grow another set of wings with mm. the uh, the facilities and the breadth of the the vision mm. that Manly have from from uh, Dave, with Dave and Vanessa down there. Um, size of the glass is important too. Um, yes. What are my thoughts on the Norland glass? Uh, the Norland glass is. Uh, that's the one with the. It's like a glass inside a. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, crafty on the Norland glass, not. And this this is a whiskey glass. It's basically taking this sort of shape um, so like the Glen Khan sort of shape or like the small shape and putting it in a wider glass so it feels bigger um, not I'm not a huge fan personally um, if I want to hold a big glass I kind of want that space in there as well and also it has a really thick lip um, on it so it feels like I'm drinking out of like one of those sippy cups that you give right. to you know one year olds um, I, is it does it kind of like I'm just looking at it now? Does it kind of keep the temperature constant? Would that be a factor? Without yeah, but, but, you don't, but, you don't, but you don't want that, right? I think mm. that for me is part of the the beauty of, of glassware is is you know, and when you know, classic example when we're sampling a, a whiskey that we might bottle, so we're talking about an investment of tens of thousands of dollars as a single cask for the oak barrel. We need to make sure that whiskey is good in every environment. So when we try it, we'll put the the glass in the fridge mm. so when we pour the whiskey out for the first time it's cold it's almost like it has ice because we don't know whether mm. people are going to be using it with ice then we hold it in our, our glass um, we drink it as it warms up and the whiskey changes and I think whether that's in a really hard call because we're concentrating at that point because you know $30,000 mistakes are not mistakes you want to be making but even at home you know you go okay and that's why you, you pour you know a decent dram and you go back and your glass and might be getting you know warmer or then you put it down mm. I think that's part of you know all these things are living breathing things yeah. um, so I think any glass that you know would purport to keep you know temperatures constant and mm. keep things constant is sort of missing that's part of the fun for me you know see how yeah. things evolve do you think it's a testament to a good spirit that it should taste good in any glass yeah yeah and I have been and you know in my previous life involved in the music industry mainly uh, you know sometimes in BYO festivals, mm. maybe being involved in the crew, smuggling some mm. things in a week before the gates open and security arrive, and just out of like uh, those like tin mugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had some of the greatest whiskey memories. Played some of the greatest games of yeah. cards at like three a.m. Drinking decent, but yeah. you know, not groundbreaking whiskey out of aluminium mugs. I had some of the best tasting whiskey I've ever had in my life. I remember taking. Um 
close to sort of eight hundred dollar glass bottles of well, g- like pours of, of Burgundy home in um, coffee cups in restaurants that I worked in London with a bit of glad wrap over the top. And you yep. get home to your your little terrible little room there and open it up and, and enjoy, you know, Dujac and um, Latash, stuff like that, out of a coffee cup. Still and good. Still very good. Instagram tell me I've got one, hour, one minute and 33 seconds remaining. Apparently you can only go live for Instagram in an hour. Told you, it's, it's for millennials. Yeah, okay, yeah. so like they obviously haven't realised, Instagram hasn't figured out how, <laughs> like, how much shit we can talk. <laughs> Give us a couple of bottles and... Um, yeah, we might need more than a minute. Yeah. Oh, well. That's right. We, we, can, we can start just, it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Take that, Instagram. So Shant, Shanty and Manly having mm. a back-to-back conversation mm-hmm. at the moment. It's going to shut down in a minute. So you guys know how to <laughs> private message each other so you can figure that out. Um, so, I mean, like, I guess that's the thing as well is when you were over in, in Europe, mm-hmm. there's a temperature difference as well. Like, you can put your water bottle out the window mm. yeah. and have it come back yeah. as ice. So, yep. um, you know, the the group, um, well, it's not a group, but like the, the mean temperature, the average temperature is going to be a little yeah. bit lower over there. I think it's also like it's, it's, it's everything, especially like well, I notice it when I come to wine is the wines that I like now are different to the wines that I liked when I lived in that environment due to what I was eating, you know, the temperature of the day, the people that I was with, everything like that. Just, you know, I'd gravitate. Being colder, I'd definitely gravitate towards heavier reds. Now that I'm back in Australia for the last couple of years, like all I want to drink is is you know Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling, Chardonnay, Chardonnay as well. Yeah, Chardonnay. Can I have some more sherry? You can. Yeah. Um, um, we're about to disappear oh, from Instagram, so but we're going to come back in a second, I think. Fingers at the ready. Because I I got nothing better to do. Ah, oh, whiskeyography just said I've got a really good story or something like that. Uh, how do I do this? You just. No, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you yeah and then, then you hold the I thing down. This one. No, you, it's a different way. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. there we go. Ah, oh, I've never done this before. Facebook are looking at me going like, you bloody idiot. <laughs> who, who doesn't know how to go live on Instagram? Um, Zeno, leave me and the other millennials alone. We are doing the best we can. You and Matt love to pick on the younger generation. Yes, mate, it's well, bloody hard. Yeah. But him, it should just be one button. Him and Matt are also like pushing 60. So. Yeah. And that, that's our average age between us, <laughs> is, is 60. Um, whiskeyography, I think yeah. you might have he posted... He literally just said something about a good story and I missed it. Yeah, just as we like disappeared into the into the night. Um, <laughs> but like, it's it's really hard. Like I've, I've never had this much technology going at any time. There's so many screens. Uh, good wine and spirits taste good in any cup, just need a little aeration and away you go. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, Will, uh, we need to meet and chat I think when, when bars open up I think we need to organise a time where we can go and talk about this because um, I think I think a lot of our um, yeah. ideologies shall we say uh, align quite well yeah. pushing 60 is the new pushing 40 yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah god I'm old I remember when I was young I remember that was a good time it was a long time ago but I remember I was young once it was good fun um we're almost out of this. What are we going to drink after this? I don't know. Should I'll we play to a vote? Yeah. What should we drink next? That's a. Good Please question. make it cold. Uh, pen ink and temperature differentials. Yes. That's what I wanted to hear. That's <laughs> what I wanted to hear with geography. <laughs> um, and it's it's funny. It's a very good point. And yes, welcome into the uh, pen forecast. Like this is essentially a. A, what a you know three hundred dollar pennant and that, that's quite cool. The more expensive ones need to be used every day, um, and it, it's tough because they get cold and you know people see weird like I'm rubbing my pens together to try and like just the heat of my hands to get the ink to flow quickly. But um, yeah, I'm sure there's some very good pens. Got some um, the best whiskey you have, Port Charlotte ten, um, blah blah blah. Okay, Boomer. Oh, yeah, that's fair enough. I'll take that one. It's really cold it's like, Fiano. Oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I know where that's coming from. Oh, I, I think I've got some really cold Fiano. Brendo Cardi. Can we do that, actually? Let's I do that. So. Yeah. yeah. Brendo, we absolutely. Ah, oh, and the team from Brave New... See, all the wine guys come out late. That's where all the cool kids... Yeah. All the cool kids come out late. But uh, Yoko and Andreas of Brave New Wine have tuned in as well. Okay, guys, how are you? How are you doing? Um, um, all of your stuff is sold out. 
very quickly. No, this isn't it. Yeah, but there's a Fiano there. I can see exactly Fiano. Or is there just one left? No one buy the Fiano online right now because <laughs> we're about to drink the last bottle. Um, so I'll get the best whiskey I've got, um, which is obviously Jamison. But maybe I'll go for something a little bit higher um, uh, price point there. Uh, Mezcal. Yes, okay, we can do that. Um, mate, someone called me a boomer, which is excellent because boomers have money and like they're in houses and things, don't they? You're not really a boomer. No. Oh, maybe you are. Maybe, maybe I'm a boomer but at heart. This is what we're going to drink next. It's beautiful. We just finished the fourth bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we drank three whiskeys. Uh, three tasters of whiskey in the heart with 500 um, more bottles of sherry. I don't think we've done this on the stream and there's only a tiny little bit left of it saving it for you know customers that come into the store and want to try it but obviously that's you know not happening so um or authenticus did we do this on this stream or did it on another stream no we did the um the batch two okay yeah we so did the batch two a, few a 30 ago. year old peter ben Riak, um authenticus Pull out a Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Oh God, they just, the whiskies are so boring and they're so bad, those ones. Do they just make you think of Matt Bailey? Yeah. yeah. The less I can think about Matt Bailey, the better. No, um, but I do have a Scotch Malt. I can't sell it to you, but I just leave it under the, the counter to, to drink a little bit. We can do that in a sec. Um, but obviously, authenticus, which is a Latin word. Um, it's where we get the word authentic, <laughs> funnily enough. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If, uh, that, that's what I, uh, you know, I learned in school. Um, but it actually means from the source is the direct translation for authenticus um, in, in Latin. So yeah, it's, and I find that quite interesting the way it's moved through. Mm. So I'm gonna neck this sherry. Yay to the legends at Winona Wine as well. Um, oh, the yeah. best bottle store north of the bridge. And maybe, maybe south of the bridge as well, probably, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, because where, where are they exactly located? Manly. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's yeah. Just like it's a, it's a stone throw from the ferry. So, Eight. being a proud Western Sydney boy, yeah, there's not many things above the bridge that I like. I don't. I <laughs> sometimes I actually refuse to acknowledge it's existed. Yeah, we're known to wine the team there and what they do and what they um, mm. get out to people. Um, it might be one of the things I like. Well, so I, I lived in Manly for uh, what was it, six months when I started here. I know, and I pretended. And I was, remember when I didn't every, talk to you at work? Every day I was doing that that ferry thing of catching the ferry um, back and forth and like yeah Manly was just begging for a shop just like Winona and it got it which I'm very pleased about yep um, there's been a lot of uh, comments made about what we should drink and we will get to it all um, I want to say a big welcome actually just on the Facebook here to Nicole Lindsay I don't know if she jumped in and out um, one of the my favorite people in, in whiskey we was lucky enough to work a table with her on kill mm. um at whiskey and dreams in melbourne a few years ago um and like she you know lives on isla she's now actually working for my favorite distillery of all time in terms of like springbank and glengyle and that company down in campbelltown but i remember just sitting there at that table being a little bit hungover particularly on <laughs> day two and the less said about that night, uh, Kathleen Davis and Ian Croucher, the better. Um, but I just soaked up the knowledge and just to, every time she posts something on Facebook, I'm learning something new. So Nicole, thank you very much. Keep up, keep it up, because I'm learning something very good. Um, can I have some wine, please? Mm. Do you want what I think was referred to as hipster booze? I think that's what Brendan's talking about. Yeah, okay, so H I think, I think he's calling, he's calling his own wine as hipster booze. I'm okay with that. Is, isn't that the ultimate, um, not alpha play, but like the, um, What's the other one? Uh, what? Alpha plate? Yeah, mean? but like to, to, to be to be a boomer and then they like try and disguise yourself by drinking... Not like weird flex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's like, I'm the worst boomer ever. Don't own anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I don't know what uh, what's that thing that they talk about. Uh, I've seen you write some like pretty aggressive Facebook comments though. That's, yeah. a, that's a boomer thing to do. Okay, so, yeah. and, and like when I, I call my my pizza and say your delivery drive was not good enough like that sort of thing uh, yeah yeah, okay, yeah kind of yeah um comments coming in uh nick are awesome i don't know if there's someone's talking to someone else um <laughs> we're actually going to do a bit of a japanese virtual tasting we because they don't come in miniatures or they they do but they're collectible so they're like 50 bucks a pop so they're ridiculously expensive um 
we're working on that um, and it's going to include uh, Nika and Suntory and hopefully some other stuff as well. So do a, a brand agnostic um, Japanese whiskey tasting, which is what we would have done anyway. Um, we're working on that. I don't know one asked that question, but um, I'm just answering that. And we do have Reg Paps, the legend himself. Uh, we were talking manly on the Instagram. He's jumped in on the Facebook. Um, it's a party. It's a party. It's like, it's good. We should start the live stream at 20 to 10 every night. Yeah. Um, I'm doing my best <laughs> to make it feel like Tio's and Rover. Because that's where, <laughs> that's where I would be. Um, I'm obviously not. Um, do you want to talk about this wine? Um, so this is prompted by the winemaker... Yeah, um, Brennan Carter from from Unico's LA down in is it the hills Adelaide Hills? They, yeah, well, I think the fruits from the Ruland. Okay, predominantly, yeah. Um, but uh, experts at Fiano and Nero Davila, but uh, have known to make some very very good. I, mean, well, I think we can nearly got all of it in here, don't we? Syrah, Pinot, um, a, a Dolcetto, which was Cherry Fields, which is now Jungle Jungle, Truffle Hound, Nebbiola Barbera, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris. Esoterico, when we can get our hands on it. Um, More, please. Uh, well, there's another red. Dolcetto ne Barbera. There's, uh, a, um, there's a... Um, uh, not a Sangiovese, something else. No, no, there's um, the, the Nero, Nero Davila. Yeah. Um, the Nebbiolo, isn't it? That's Truffle Hound. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah. The, spa, the Blanc de Blanc sparkling, the Merlot, we've got uh, Harvest Syrah... And the flossy rosé, which okay. was excellent, you, um, and the oh, harvest, and the, the, the river, which was near Adelaide. Okay, yeah. um, the harvest. So there's Unico Zello wines, yeah, and then there's this harvest series, mm -hmm. and the harvest series is quite important, isn't it? Yeah. So I believe I think it's. Don't quote me on this, but I believe there's a portion of every. Don't uh, quote me on this. Por portion. Yeah, there's a portion of of uh, the profits of every bottle sold that goes back to local uh, farmers uh, in the Riverland region yeah, and maybe which, the hills as well. Which is incredibly important at times like yeah. now, particularly um, you know, through Adelaide that was devastated. I mean, you know, when it's, when it's right, we need to do something yeah. with um, uh, our friends down at Vintelopa. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. See, if anyone's so Winona and anyone else listening, you need to get more uh, supply of Esoterico. Not too bad. It's all gone. Yeah, go. We just we just took it all back. <laughs> get get two idiots. Get yeah, on the yeah. live stream and just talk about it. Apparently, it's worth fifty percent of profits. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So huge, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was it was it was really interesting talking about um, talking to. I'm, I'm rowing back um, to a conversation I had about eleven a.m. this morning with uh, Feathertop and um, Janelle Marsden, the owner of Feathertop wineries down in sort of like east of Beechworth and I sort of said how do we how do we support I know I can support wineries distilleries breweries producers because I can go buy directly off them or we can as the as a business buy it and sell it to our customers but what about the cafes what about the pubs what about the post office and that sort of thing and she said you know and it's very very true every you know every dollar spent in a regional area probably goes around the town six times because it pays for a staff member, it pays for a staff member at the post office, all of a sudden she goes and buys a present for a mum for Mother's mm. Day and sends that around. So when, you, when you're buying off these places, and it's, you know, whether you're buying directly or buying off people like ourselves or other independent bottle stores, that money is keeping these businesses alive so that in 12 months time, we can all be there, you know, having drinks over the, the local pub and mm you know, walking through wineries. And I think we miss a lot of things, a lot of, you know, and a lot of it is a revolve around for, for us particularly is going to the bars at night and, you know, doing that sort of thing. But what do I, like, another thing I miss is touching vineyards yeah. and touching stills and like going and just breathing clean air and all that sort of stuff. So we'll, we'll get out there, but everyone, um, yeah, like every dollar you, you spend off a regional producer, whether that is of wine, beer, whiskey, olive oil, meat, apple juice, yeah, veggies, nuts, ve like anything. Yeah, there's so many brilliant farms all across the country that are doing like um, boxes. Yeah. You know, so there's obviously everyone's at home that are cooking. I know I'm buying a bunch of them at the moment. Um, just yeah, getting getting some local organically farmed veggies to your house because you know these guys might. Oh, I've been predominantly serving restaurants, right? 
and their whole business based off restaurants and yeah, just um, yeah, buying up all their crop and yeah, keeping them keeping them moving. Yeah, it's um it's very 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 important at, at this point in time because um, you know you know we we would complain about being bored and being mm. isolated and, and that sort of thing and I can't do all the things I want to do. There's farmers who still need to work because they can't mm. not work, um, who are you know whether they can isolate or not they, they need to work and we rely on farmers every day everything that's sold in this shop comes from the ground whether it is a beer a wine or a whiskey it is grain it is a fruit of some sort so farmers are the most important people in the world as far as i'm concerned um and they're to farm you need space it needs to be regional and right now those communities are in real real trouble um for for the year from hell and you know it's it's funny like you speak to people now and you don't need to no one needs to tell you yeah. that it's been tough you just sort of go yep okay this, like, we've run out of hyperbole I like hyper, hyperbole yeah. for, for this so we just sort of talk it's like yep okay what do, we, what do we do next yeah I mean I think yeah it's it's, it's grim you know uh, worldwide I think basically and um, I think we touched on a little bit last week but uh of the the few positive things to kind of come out of all this is just the, the pure innovation that is we're seeing in not only in, in retailers but like restaurants um bars you know far, farmers are like people like i know a lot of distributors going um you know offering straight to customers which is which is great um you know a lot of bars you know trying to sell or just trying to trying to cook food to people that are at home that might not have like that don't have that 